The following is a conversation with Thomas Werner. He's a teacher, consultant, artist, lecturer, author, and former gallery owner in New York and just an overall forceful figure in the international art community. Thomas published The Fashion Image in 2018 and has currently penned and waiting for release his latest book, one on the business of fine art photography, which makes it very coincidentally relevant for the subject that we ended up speaking about in this podcast. Thomas has had some fascinating experiences in both Russia and China, and uh, we do speak about it in the chat, but the primary reason I reached out to him was to get his professional insight into just how the business of fine art works. This was such an enjoyable chat to be a part of because Thomas is really such a good speaker. And as you guys listening know, um, I admire so much really refined speakers, the likes of Christopher Hitchens, Tim Butcher, Chael Sonnen, these types come to mind. But but keep an ear out for what I'm talking about. And then also notice Thomas's experience going from a serendipitous interaction on the uh, platform of a train station that turned into what was ultimately, in retrospect, a life-changing gig in Russia. This chat is separated into two pretty distinct parts. The first hour is Thomas's experiences in both Russia and China with the meta theme on artistic expression between these cultures. And then the second hour is the business side of things. So everything from artificial scarcity to gallery ship to commerciality and, and more. In this conversation, you can expect to hear about what it's like working as an American in both China and Russia, what the international photography market looks like, the necessity of a gallery, e-commerce and NFTs within fine art, and then plus more and more and more as well. Finally, do make sure you hang around to the end to hear my afterthoughts from the chat and as well for me to explain what my ambition is for this podcast. And so with no further ado, here is the amazing Thomas Ben. Hello, Thomas. How are you? Thank you for joining me on a crisp early morning for you. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on the podcast. And yes, it's, I think, minus three out this morning. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's a thrill. It's a pleasure of mine. I came across a video of you on YouTube sort of explaining the business of fine art photography or the business of galleries with fine art photography, I suppose. And I guess you get a lot of traction from that. I've never seen more overwhelming comments in a YouTube section as well. Thank you. No, the response has been great. Uh, it was done for B&H Camera and went out on their YouTube and, I, and it's been shared across multiple platforms. So mm -hmm. It was nice to be able to put something out that would really help people. I think a lot of that information people hold a little too dear. Mm -hmm. I'm coming in at the realm of photography from an outsider, uh, you know, corporate background, very commercially minded, you know, all words allergic to the artistic types. So I was very interested in what you're doing, extremely interested in what David Yarrow is doing, for example, someone else is very commercially minded, but also producing amazing art. And uh, that's what I really want to sort of nail down with you, understand a little bit more the economics of photography and potentially how different business models could evolve from the traditional, how it is. But to start, um, I will have already introduced you, but since you wear and have worn so many different hats, lived in so many different areas, I'd actually just love for you to say in your own words what it is that you do. <laughs> I get asked that a lot recently. Uh, at, at this moment, I'm an educator, an author, and a creative consultant. So as an educator, I still teach. I was the director of the photography program at Parsons School of Design for five years and also full-time faculty for 16 years. I'm teaching some classes at the New York Film Academy and some independent workshops and one-on-one. -on -one. I teach a lot one-on-one -on -one fashion and fine art. Uh, I was the author of the book, The Fashion Image for Bloomsbury Publishing London, and just recently finished up a book titled The Business of Fine Art Photography for Rutledge. It'll be coming out uh, in July of this year, and just signed a contract to do a third book on photography for Thames and Hudson I'm looking forward to. Uh, as a creative consultant, I help people build their careers. I help them understand how to develop portfolios, develop body of work, how to find the niche in the fine art market, or the fashion market, or the photo world, or even uh, how to do public speaking, how to position themselves as a thought leader without sounding too grand. And, uh, and recently a number of clients who are moving into film, so people who are doing independent film, uh, documentary, and some other work. So working with them to help 
either get their work seen or to help reposition themselves outside of the film industry. It's, uh, yeah, that all came about due to the pandemic. That was never the plan. Oh, really? My, well, that's exciting. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, the first book was a complete accident. Uh, my, my whole career has been kind of a series of beautiful mistakes and accidents. Uh, the first book, The Fashion Image, I received an email from a woman in Miami who said she was here from London. And did I know somebody who had an idea for a book or did I have one? And I thought, well, I'm not inviting everyone else to lunch. We had lunch and I gave her three ideas and she said, well, instead of writing three books, she should write the book. And I was very naive and said, oh, okay. And took on, the, took on a book. I'd never written anything more than a 10 page term paper. And it's a brutal process. Um, the rest of it, the creative consulting and all came about uh, I decided to leave New York and have a take a break, to be honest, do a road trip around the country. And I had a series of projects set up with a client in Russia, I mean, not Russia, in China. And two in the U.S. were canceled. And then I was meeting, I was supposed to meet them in Rome and had never been to Italy before. So went down to Pompeii and, you know, Capri and all that. And on the way back to Rome, I received an email or text that uh, they weren't allowed on their flight from La Sanza due to COVID. And we had planned nine large-scale workshops across China and, and uh, Europe. So Italy, the UK, France, Germany, we're in Russia. And all that was wiped out. So traveling, speaking, curating, all the work I was doing in Russia, I'd been there for 16 years at that point. Um, and all the workshops I'd planned that was my transition and, and hers, to be quite frank. I mean, she was building a business as well. Mm -hmm. That was all wiped out. So like many of us, wild, you have to decide what to do next and, yeah. um, and hope it works. So it's been, it's been a challenge and it's been fun. I love teaching one-on-one -on -one and I love helping people with their careers. I think not being gratuitous there, I mean, it, it really is a bit of a selfish endeavor. I get a lot of pleasure out of it. So, yeah. <laughs> That's how this happened. Beautiful. You said beautiful mistakes and accidents. Um, it's yes. just another word for serendipity, isn't it? I mean, you're putting yourself I, into certain situations that expose you to whatever the infinite set of possibilities are at your feet. And I guess this one was authorship and who knows where that's going to take you. But that sounds very exciting, to be honest. Yeah, it's, it's, it is exciting. Uh, the possibilities, the potential is there as a, you know, coming from business perspective, certainly. Uh, the idea of moving that consulting from individuals to larger scale projects is certainly there. Uh, I get to stay in the creative field and I still make, so I get to write and I get to shoot. And it's a little bit indulgent. It, it completely is. Well, I got my job at Parsons the same way. I went to leave a trade organization called the American Society of Media Photographers. And at the meeting, they had problems with the New York chapter, about 700 members. And it's seven, at that point, it was like a 7,000 member organization here. And they said, you're the only one who's willing to stand up to these guys. Will you run the chapter? I'd gone to quit. So I said, yes, only if we could do a steering committee. I didn't want to be president. So I ran the steering committee, a group of 20 amazing people. And then we started to do, before anybody really did, we started to do big talks. So large scale talks with Getty, or I, I did a talk called Art and Commerce at NYU with Kathy Ryan from The Times. and. Jeannie Greenberg from, well, at that point it was Greenberg, Van Doren, Rohan Gallery. Uh, she's a gallerist in New York, and a number of other, Picathy Biondi from New Yorker. And Parsons, I didn't know what Parsons was. They saw the work that I was doing and asked if I would teach a business class. And that turned into three classes, and that turned into the directorship. So I had no idea. I just, things were slow. It was post 9 11. And again, my business was crushed. At 9/11, uh, I had a studio in the city, and that all ended. So took on the gig at Parsons. I had an empty studio and threw some work up on the wall and ended up with an art gallery. So I became a gallerist and an educator completely because uh, everything else had been kind of destroyed, yeah. and uh, it was it was a lot of fun. So yeah, that's my whole career. Sounds like a very quintessential. Life can be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. You know, the, uh, no indicator of the past is going to tell you where you're going to go. There's a lot of no. beauty in that, a lot of upside too, in the unpredictable. I, th 
I think so. And in the creative field, I think of any area of business, we're increasingly open to that idea that if you are willing to work, we, we were in a time, I think, of deep specialization, particularly in the arts in the 80s and 90s, early 2000s. If you didn't do one thing, you weren't respected. And we're in an era right now that happened, I think, in the 20s and 30s with the Surrealists and Dadists and happened in the 70s and 80s when you had Studio 54 and you know artists and authors and musicians and everybody working together, filmmakers. And we're in one of those beautiful moments now where people celebrate you working across multiple fields mm. and embracing that kind of creativity. And I don't think that will go on forever. At some point, you know, people want you to specialize and corporations step in and everything goes back to what we consider normal. But mm. I think it's kind of a beautiful moment. That's cool. That's a very interesting insight as well that you think there is almost a cyclical nature to specialization than generalization. Uh, I think at the moment, you're t- totally on point. I see the same signals of the ideal romanticization of worship of the polymath or of the person who is more of a generalist, more interested in many, many different things, not necessarily an expert in any one of them, but just the fact that they have their fingers in so many different pies is like a respectable idea. So you really think that's cyclical, do you? I do, I do. If you look at the 20s and 30s, you had the Dadists and Surrealists and you had filmmakers. You had Man Ray, who never considered himself a photographer, but is a legendary image maker. He was a filmmaker, an artist. Uh, uh, he drove contemporary culture. You had a whole group of people like that. So mm. we had a period, right? Then we had it in the 70s and 80s, where you had people collaborating, musicians, authors, fashion designers, once again. And that went away to a certain extent. And now is back. So no, I, I do think it's cyclical. I think it's the nature of everything. It's kind of like the film industry was the Wild West. Then it became a little more organized. Then it became corporate. And then all of a sudden you had YouTube. Now that's becoming less of the Wild West. And I think you see that in probably every field, for better or worse, as money and management and organization comes in. And in terms of celebrating people who have multiple skills, I do think we value that more or less depending on where we are culturally. Personally, I've found, much to my surprise, that my value to clients now is more that I was a gallerist and an author, and I've worked internationally, and I've curated, and I've written, and I've worked a little bit in film and done other things. So that's the value. But 10 years ago, that wasn't the value at all. The value was one field or another as a specialist. And now people are are interested in how can I how can I build out a career that actually takes me across multiple platforms for your in your eyes who embodies this uh this feeling right now the best for you like the generalist if you have to think about it doesn't necessarily have to be a client of yours but someone who makes you because there's people in the culture that will signal this for you right who's someone that does that for you at the moment that's interesting well, I think, you know, you have to go with Elon Musk, right? He does everything okay, and he, he sure. does it boldly. Or, you know, But he's not necessarily a company, considered like, a creative, is he? I mean, 100%, you're totally right that he's a generalist um, and worshipped as such. Yeah, and an, and an expert at the same time. I think, uh, no, I, th- I think he works across a range of projects that's impressive. I would say the same thing for a company like Virgin. Right, that started out as a record store and moved into airlines and moved into, I mean, Richard Branson, those people were, they were both probably early examples of this when few other people were. Um, and of course, every, you know, a number of people who are working online have developed things in areas that allowed them to move multiple, across multiple platforms. It's interesting, as an artist or as a creative, I'd have to think about that. I, I'm inspired by a lot of my friends and people I know, but, um, there isn't somebody I've looked at as an icon or somebody to emulate uh, in this area. So I'm sorry I don't have a better answer for you. No, no, no Musk problem. Is common. It, Musk is a great one. Perhaps the archetypal yeah. one as well. I mean, he's yeah. almost got the Nikola Tesla uh, <laughs> and Leonardo da Vinci uh, yeah. comparisons being made of him. Someone who is, yeah. as you say, an expert in so many different areas. and building so many different companies but he's also kind of funny but he's also somehow relatable despite his riches he also dates movie stars he also has a bunch of kids yeah. he's also from another yeah. country like there is a lot of things about elon that make him this kind of archetypal character right i love that he works across multiple platforms i don't think you know i, I mean, my father was a factory worker and could tool a perfect piece of metal to a thousandth or 
ten thousandth of an inch. I mean, that's art mm. to me. Mm. I think working in the sciences can be absolute art. So I, mm. I think that the work that, that Musk does or that he aspires to do is well, certainly creative. You have to have a creative mind to believe that you can, you know, build a car company and develop new batteries and run solar everywhere and you're going to put up a new form of internet and, you know, mm-hmm. low-hanging satellites and, oh, by the way, I'm going to go to Mars. And mm-hmm. <laughs> it takes, you, I think, like being a good creative, you need to be ground, to be a successful creative, I think you need to be grounded in the reality of the business of it and you need to be able to let go and create and attempt things if you're going to be at the highest level of creativity that other people aren't thinking about. And I, I do think he does that. And so if you want to be, there are a lot of people on the business side of art and photography or creating who make work that's in the in the vast, maybe 80% in the middle, right? And we can put 10% at the bottom, our beginners, and 10% or 2% at the top, mm-hmm. where people are really groundbreaking and fearless. And uh, there are, seem to be fewer of those people at the moment, but I think the ones that are out there, certain image makers and filmmakers are extraordinary. I think we're at a moment of kind of evolution in terms of what we value creatively. It'll be interesting to see where it goes. Cool. And not to beleaguer the point too much, but uh, if you look at the podcasting area, I think these types, especially the ones that are doing it at the at the tail end of the distribution, the ones that do have the million plus downloads per episode types, uh, I'm thinking of two in mind, Lex Friedman and Joe Rogan. Uh, they obviously have very specific audiences. They're not wide reaching, but they're both individuals who have a lot more going on than simply just this show which people might know them for and uh, that could also be another signal of the generalist i can't imagine that say in america howard stern is the famous guy you know in australia we've got like hamish and andy i mean there are famous radio presenters Uh, they maybe did tv on the side but they were just personalities they didn't also have interesting businesses on the side or eclectic curiosities they were just a charisma that you could put in front of a microphone so that's kind of changing as well i mean whether that's changing or it's just the podcasting technology has allowed them to now enter who knows but well i think somebody like joe rogan saw audience share and got into it early because i'm guessing he found a certain freedom there and and found an audience and and built it you know he's whether you agree with his politics or not and that's not what i'm discussing i think you i think um and whether you like him or not, he certainly is fearless and takes it on and goes at it 100%. And people, people like that. Certain, you know, millions of people like that. And I, I respect that. It's amazing people. when, yeah, he, has, and he seems to have, you know, nine lives. I think he started out on Fear Factor <laughs> or something before that. And, yeah, yeah. You know, you'd never imagine being the host of Fear Factor would lead to anything. No, and precisely. And he's turned it into everything. So, yeah. I respect that, definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, if we can hold on to that thread throughout the chat, I think that would be really interesting. But thinking about what the uh, generalization means in the creative space at the moment. But to the prepared questions, um, talk to me a little bit about your experiences in Russia. So you've lived in St. Petersburg for such a long time. This is very fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, very long story short, I took a quick trip to Russia as part of... First, I drove the Baltics and had an extraordinary time because they're very welcoming and easy and people are quite nice. And then decided I wanted to drive Romania because I'd heard there were villages at the back of Romania that hadn't even been touched by communism. Uh, I got there. The country was still quite dangerous at the time and the people at the hotel kind of begged me not to go what on the year trip. It would have been 2005. And um, I went to my room and I saw a CNN Romania story on people in a village who'd been selling their kidneys. And I thought, to put roofs on their houses and blankets for their kids. And I thought, if people are selling their kidneys, I'm certainly expendable in my, mm-hmm. with all my equipment and my red car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and went to Russia for four days and came back and ran into a guy on a train platform in Philly with a bag that said U.S. Embassy Moscow and asked him if, uh, told him I want to do a project. And he told me, he said, uh, you know, if you're going to work with people, first he said, if you go to Russia, everyone's going to think you're a spy. 
And if you're a spy and you work with people, they'll lose their job. And if you do a bad job, they can lose their job. And if you do a good job, they gain absolutely nothing. So why should anybody ever work with you? If you can figure that out, you can work in Russia. So I gave him, I gave him my, uh, he gave me a business card. I sent a proposal. He did a background check and gave me two email addresses. And I was very naive and got all dressed up and got on a plane to Russia. I didn't really speak any Russian at that point. And met one woman. She gave me the name of uh, Bajanov, who did founded the National Museum for Contemporary Art. And he looked at me like an alien and beamed in. He sent me to a gentleman named Yosef Bakstein, who was starting the very first Moscow Biennale. So I got to speak at the first Biennale, and then I went to St. Petersburg, and I've never worked for the U.S. State Department, but they funded quite a bit of my work, along with a number of foundations. And they put me in touch with people at the Hermitage, so I spoke at the Hermitage, and we put together a State Hermitage Museum, which is like the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And we had a eight-year collaboration, nine-year collaboration, and state the U.S. State Department traveled. Uh, I traveled as part of a delegation of three Soviet cities. So I met a bunch of photographers. They would say, "Oh, Dolmas, you must meet my friends in Murmansk. They are great." And I would go to Murmansk, and it all kind of took off. I worked in thirty-three Murmansk. cities. Yeah, That's a thirty. Bit of a... You know Murmansk? Yeah, it's yeah, near I you. Do. Yeah, I've been there well, four or five times. <laughs> I love it. Um, it's a crazy great place. And really, that's funny you say that. It actually has a reputation of being literally the worst city in the world. And I'm it's not rough. Just, yeah, that's not my <laughs> opinion. I've never been there, but <laughs> wow. Well, it's, it's, it's a tough city, but the people have been very great. And uh, yeah, I mean, they're just great adventures. The people in the photo club are amazing. I was offered a chance to ride on an icebreaker if I had 25 grand. I mean, things just pop up in places sure, like that that yeah. you would never imagine. So I worked in 33 cities. It's so funny that you know where once. Yeah. What an experience. So yeah. Yeah. So it's been great. And a lot of small cities, a lot of big cities have been in the Caucasus, um, Vladivostok on the other side of the country and really had an extraordinary time. It was a gift. And I, I've, I've, um, the first talk at the, what really spurred it on was the first talk at the Hermitage. Actually, it was our very first contemporary art exhibition. And I walked in with Mary Ellen from the Department of State, and she said to Sophia, who walked up from the Hermitage, Sophia said, we, there was a gentleman who couldn't speak. He couldn't get his visa. Chuck Close was speaking. Someone else, this other gentleman, couldn't. So Mary Ellen said, well, why don't you have Thomas speak? And Sophia was two feet away from me, and she looked me up and down and said, oh, Mary Ellen, I don't know. <laughs> I said, I'm right here. You know? And Mary Ellen said, look, we don't want to cancel it. You should have him speak. So I spoke, and then we did a follow-up. And in Russia, people come up at the end and take pictures and ask for autographs. It's normal. And one girl came up. We ended up curating or critiquing work for about six and a half hours. And one girl who's still a friend came up and said, well, I just want to thank you. You give us hope. And I thought, there's probably no place else in the world I can do that. So I will come back as long as they'll let me. And I've been lucky. I've had a visa every year since, um, gone back every year since. And that's really what sparked the travel, that, and it was an extraordinary adventure. I mean, every city you go to is different, even if it's Murmansk. And, uh, I can only imagine, and, really. Yeah. Yeah, the Soviet Russian cities are the best. I mean, it's like the Wild West. You never know what you're going to run into. And do you, I mean, your last name is very German. Do you have some sort of Russian in you? Do you speak Russian? Like, how do you get around? Uh, I can speak Russian. I don't have any Russian in me. I think my grandfather and gra uh, was German on my dad's side and my grandmother Polish. And I think uh, probably my grandmother taught me a lot without knowing it about how to exist in Russia. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I speak, I learned Russian there. I learned very quickly that if you learn Russian in the U.S. and speak it in Russia, they will disrespect you greatly. Uh, they'll give you a hard time about having a bad American accent. So... I would ask people over and over, how do you say, you know, what is this? How do you say in Russian? Bottle, how do you say this? And I've slowly learned enough to get around. And then increasingly people speak English and you learn to depend on the kindness of strangers, which isn't my nature in the sense that I, I like to have things taken care of, right? It's hard to go into a city and have to depend on, you know, people that you've never met when you're in the middle of 
you know, you're in the middle of the Urals, so you're in the middle of Siberia. Amazing. And, and it's probably made me a kinder person and uh, because people have been very kind and, and uh, also more understanding when I run into people who travel abroad, whether they're, I meet them in the States or at an airport somewhere, and uh, they need help. So, yeah, it's, it's been an extraordinary experience. Russia is also tough. You know, it's a very physical and demanding place. And, uh, and you know, New York is kind of the precursor to that. And Russia's next level tough. So <laughs> you, you learn that too, um, how to stand up, how you have to stand up for yourself. And, uh, you know, it was demanding. It was an extraordinary life experience. Between the, you know, they closed, I worked a lot with a, consulate in St. Petersburg once the Russians closed that that had a big effect and then they've reduced our staff in Moscow the Russians have uh, by almost three quarters so working in Russia is increasingly difficult and COVID is just running rampant right now so I don't think I'd go back until they begin to get that under control a little bit at least but I miss it miss my friends I have great dear friends there there's some very 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 good people there for all I've said you know, I've, I've met some of the best people. Yeah, people uh, always say, always comment on just how much fun Russia is. <laughs> and and it's, it's something that maybe builds this mystique for them all everywhere else around the world. You know, that they have this reputation for just being extremely jovial, but not in any sort of caricatural sense, just no. good fun to be with. Um, do you know Peter yeah. Pomerantsev by any chance? I, I don't. Yeah, he's a he's a British author, Ukrainian born, um, and he wrote a book called about Russia, where nothing's true and everything's possible. And he also wrote a book called uh, "This is Not Propaganda." So he's a journalist, uh, really. I mean, in his own right, super fascinating guy. Um, but he he made a comment about Russia, just that Russians he meets abroad he meets abroad are always so bored. Because there isn't the same emotion, there isn't the same energy that they get in their hometown. And, uh, you know, again, it just sort of adds to the allure of the Russian. What is it about Russia that makes it so fascinating? I'd love to know. <laughs> yeah, well, there is that there is that allure and there is that kind of emotional intensity in the idea of Russian soul. And uh, people are fearless. You know, they'll take on creativity in a way that people in the rest of the world don't right now. They're creatively fearless. They uh, live life with an extraordinary passion, for better or for worse. And uh, that's alluring. And then you go to a place like Siberia, where the countryside itself is just rugged, and people are really connected to that rugged earth, and they're living uh, maybe a more challenging, but a really vibrant lifestyle. Uh, and yeah, there's, there's a lot to be said. Each region's very different. Every city is very different, despite Russians' belief that they're all kind of the same, except for Moscow and St. Peter. I, I don't find that the case at all. Yeah. I like the title of the book, Russia, where what? Nothing is true and... Everything's possible. Everything's possible. That's true. Amazing that was one title. of the allures. Everything was possible there. Truly. Yeah. Well, to a certain extent. He, he, uh, that's required reading, I think, for anyone who's interested in Russia. You, you'd love it. He talks about being in a boardroom... Uh, for one of the TV stations there and how they would sit around this big table and literally construct the propaganda without any sense of double speak. You know, they're just saying it plainly out loud. This is what we want to do. And um, just amazing. But uh, give me an example of this creative fearlessness. What, what, do, you, what do you really mean by that? What, what's Russia well, doing I that think- other people aren't? A couple of things. I think one is you have a history of people creating, still a history of people who created under the Soviet Union. And uh, certainly nonconformist artists, independent artists, photographers who could go to jail or I know people had their studios burned. I know a gentleman who was put in a sanitarium twice and then was just picked up one day and sent to Paris. They didn't even tell his family because he was making art that people didn't agree with. So. At its core, you have a deep sense of craft, a really great respect for craft and quality. And then you have uh, this idea of, I'm going to make art in the face of everyone and everything. Then you had this explosion in the 90s where, you know, sexuality wasn't allowed during the Soviet Union. Uh, Nudes weren't allowed. I I know uh, even afterwards, male nudity certainly hasn't been allowed. And 
you have people who are just taking on every subject they can because it is the Wild West and they are creative. They technically care. Um, you have this great sense of fantasy and fairy tale that they bring into their work. So you have craft, you have kind of this Soviet era of fearlessness and drive. You know, I, I find, I would meet people who maybe could barely afford their apartment, but they had a camera and they had a computer. I met people from the Soviet era who would carry water up a hill and have to make their own photochemicals out of the chemicals they could buy at the store because they couldn't get developer. Wow. They would figure it out. I don't know that we have that kind of wherewithal. So creativity there at its core, I think, is is driven from something much deeper than perhaps even the freedom we have in, in the States. We have the freedom, but we're, we do, I think, a lot less with a lot more. And they take, uh, the in general, I think the artists there take great satisfaction in, in what they do. Um, the, the thing that's missing, truly, is the understanding of what it takes to build a career, both there and globally. And I think people are slowly learning that uh, in Moscow and some other places. There's a photographer, Sasha Lubin, in Kaliningrad, who is extraordinary and building a really nice career. But there are, I think, few and far between. The idea of how you actually build a career step by step is, isn't something that I think has been discussed. And forgive me if you already mentioned it, but specifically, what was the work that you were doing? In Russia? Yeah. Uh, I, I did a number of things. So if I was traveling, if the State Department had me travel somewhere, I was the art and education person. So I would meet with local artists. I would give a talk I, about a specific topic. Um, I would meet with people at the local art schools or photo schools, and then I would meet with educators to talk about contemporary educational processes or methodologies. Um, and I have to say our State Department never asked me to say something or not say something. They never told me what to say. People always ask that, but I had extraordinary creative freedom. Um, in places like the Hermitage, I put together a proposal to have a series of joint student exhibitions, and we introduced kind of contemporary. We were the first formal kind of student collaboration in terms of photography, contemporary photography there, and we would do talks and lectures and artist collaborations. And I would do versions of all that in other cities, oftentimes on my own, funded by Trust for Mutual Understanding and other foundations as well. I would go into a city. I would either be invited to speak, so I, I had to get to the point where I was invited to speak at different conferences. I was on TV a lot. I was on the morning news and radio so a amazing. lot. So amazing, yeah. <laughs> oh no, it was extraordinary. I mean, yeah. really, I was on Cultura, which is their national cultural channel. I, I had a lot of visibility, again, for better and for worse at a certain yeah. point. And uh, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. So I would travel into a city. I did a 20 city video project uh, for the for the State Department. So I went to 20 And when you say State Department, Russian State Department. Ours. Uh, the only Russian entity are the U.S. State Department, the U.S. Department of State. The only Russian entity that I worked for outside of museums, like I partnered with little museums and other arts organizations around the country. I was lucky enough to meet the head of the uh, Ford Foundation in Russia. Uh, Irina Yerna had been running it since it was founded, and then the Russians shut it down. Well, I met Irina right after that, and she gave me her, her contacts. So I had a number of contacts through the Ford Foundation that I was able to work partner with all across the country. It was a great mm -hmm. little network. So you asked what I was doing. I did a 20-city project, a video project uh, for the Department of State, and that was... Uh, an introduction for state to how to how to work with social media and how to how to work um, with young people and this was the US Department of State right they I didn't work for them but they funded a lot of what I did and then I met Irina from the Ford Foundation she gave me her contacts when they were closing and um, the only time I worked with a Russian entity was in the region of Perm uh, at one point the Russian government, federal government, decided that they wanted to turn Perm into a uh, cultural center. Russians love, like, they have Tomsk, which is the university city. Well, they want to make Perm the, another cultural center. And they brought Murat Gelman, who had started contemporary art to a certain extent in Moscow, out to run this contemporary art museum. 
and I went and did some work with a museum. I did some work with a local university to try to develop more contemporary education. Um, I had a meeting with a vice governor and the governor who was absolutely, honestly, one of the nicest men I've met in Russia and probably <laughs> one of the most powerful. Uh, yeah, interesting. It was, yeah, well, you, yeah, you realize, you know, when somebody has that kind of power that we rarely place in the hands of one individual here. And, um, yeah, yeah, and working for a Russian university, uh, the Russian politics are just different, you know. You're, you're dealing with different layers of politics there than you are here. So you can, on one hand, you can, you can get anything done almost. My goal was to start the very first contemporary art and design university in Russia. Quite frankly, at one point, I, that became my goal. And it became unachievable. I mean, the scale wasn't achievable. The, the certain amount of the local politics were against it. And uh, financially, um, we just have so much more funding in the U.S. and abroad than the Russians do, despite the amount of money that they spend in the arts and despite the amount uh, that they value the arts. It really is, uh, it sounds like at least, just another great tale of serendipity somehow. You've ended up just bathing in, you know, marinating in these amazing experiences of a foreign country and it sort of just came seemingly out of nowhere. Um, perhaps it's a similar story. Talk to me about China because, you know, like a cheap spy novel, the American is infiltrating Russia and now China as well. Uh, what happened there and what are you doing there? Yeah, and I, I did a little, I, we used to laugh at my passport because I did a trip to Ukraine and then we went to Egypt right after the, up, during the uprising, which was a little disconcerting. And then we were in Crimea right after it was uh, annexed or taken over, or whatever word you want to use. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I did say, I'm not ruling out that you're a spy yet, actually. <laughs> you kind of, I think it's a good idea to rule that out. But I think uh, China was in part a natural extension, I thought, for me. Uh, things were coming to an end in Russia. Certainly, the politics were changing as our embassy was closing. And uh, for me, U.S. State Department support was changing. We weren't monetizing Russia in the way we did. Um, people felt that the country was standing on its own and then moving in a different direction. So there were there was few less support. Um, and I, at Parsons, I'd met a number of Chinese students, and. A colleague of mine was working with a Chinese fashion designer who asked me to go over and do a couple of lectures. And that's that was the introduction there. Um, I went and spoke to 12, six universities and six independent art schools in six cities in seven days. It was a daunting uh, trip. And then I, I went, uh, a woman had asked a model and I to fly out and teach her daughter and her friend about modeling. So this woman flew us out and for four days, put us up at a five-star hotel and treated, treated us like guests. And we just worked with her model and her her sister, her daughter and her daughter's friend to teach them modeling every day and about what that meant in the West. What what city? Oh, uh, that was in Beijing. And but, what year? Uh, that was 2019. That was uh, December 2019. And in November 2019, the talks were all across, like Changsha, Wuhan, uh, uh, Beijing. So we spoke in a number of cities. Um, and then I visited Shanghai, and which is where I met the woman that um, I put together this other collaboration with. So I did meet with our State Department in, in uh, China to see if they were interested in partnering with me and, and told them that I could probably put together the same kind of network in China that I did in Russia if they were interested because um, artists love to refer you to other artists and educators love to refer you to other educators and photographers take care of each other and for me in the arts that's been key um, and I always try to give back far more than I receive from these people so and I love in you know, China too have, their students have a different kind of challenge in terms of creativity and uh, familial pressure not to have often not to have a career in the arts um, so I st started there and met a woman through this process who a young woman in her mid-30s who was starting a business and she asked 
if I would like to do these workshops that ended up not happening due to the pandemic. So China had its own life. It was very different. And it, it works very differently than Russia. There are many similarities. It's still a bit of the Wild West. Um, but the government has a different hand in things. The Russians are there, but the Chinese are certainly there more. And, um, and the power structures are a little different. But what isn't different is the need to learn about contemporary art, learn about creativity, and help instill a belief that you can be successful and the message that it's okay. You know, for a lot of Chinese students I found, and same thing with Russian students, um, permission, kind of they needed permission. And, and I did my best to offer that. Well, there was a student at one school in China and she, we had a Q&A after a talk and she said, you know, I'm two semesters behind at my university, I'm sick and I have to take a semester off every once in a while. And I said, that's all right. You know, you have to take care of your health first. I said, just keep going, you'll finish. It'll all be okay. And she said, it'll be okay? I said, yeah, it'll all be okay. She started to cry. She said, nobody's ever told me it was gonna be okay. So no, it's absolutely fine. There's no shame in having to miss school because you have to take care of an illness. It's just not a dialogue that was had. So it's yeah. it's interesting. Wild when you pressure. Work right? with, yeah, yeah. Int intense pressure to succeed and mm -hmm. what that meant for the family and what it meant for her and culturally. And so, you know, we, we our presence uh, hopefully makes a difference. You know, you never, you just never know how. Yeah. You said that um, there isn't as much freedom of the arts in China as there was in Russia. And I suppose compared to the US, there's as, as much freedom of arts in Russia. What, what's it like working with China, especially in an artistic realm? Um, I mean, because... So two things. The Russians are far more creatively unfiltered and unafraid than we are in the US. In the US, I think we're far more for good and bad, aware of cultural implications or people are worried about what they're going to make. You don't see that in Russia at all. I mean, so on one hand, but there are topics, I don't think I'll get in trouble for saying this, but there are topics certainly that are, are uh, that artists should stay away from in Russia, right? I mean, you know, when I first got there, well, when I first got there, there was a TV show that, a comedy show where they would make jokes about Putin and Medvedev and that stopped. And then jokes about Gazprom, and that stopped, you know. So there are certain things that, uh, and certainly uh, you don't, conversations around homosexuality or sexuality are very different in Russia. Um, they're very sexually open and straight out and straightforward, but, it, um, uh, but spirit, they have very rigid laws about um, talking to anybody under 18 or exposing anybody under 18 to mm. anything having to do with homosexuality. So you need to be aware of that, I mean, artists do. Um, but you have a lot of freedom in Russia uh, even to create a lot, mm -hmm. a, mm -hmm. in a weird way more than we do, uh, in other ways not at all. Uh, in China, um, I found the government is just more present because they're everywhere, right? You have, you have WhatsApp, which is you pay everything, your social media, your method of payment for everything, your whole life is wrapped up in one app, which of course the government is aware of. So they know mm -hmm. where you go, what you say, what you do, what you create, who you talk to. You check in, my, my handler checked in with her face at every hotel, right? Say so a lot of face recognition. Um, and Wild. yeah, and the people I spoke to said they were willing to, willing to trade their privacy and freedom for their safety because mm -hmm. women felt very safe and and I understand that to a certain extent but it was interesting that everybody told me that same thing so um, that's always and, the potty line yeah 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 and and you know they're just they're far more aware of what individual artists are making and individual artists are far less unlike the Russians they're they're far less innovative. I mean, with all due respect to my, my Chinese colleagues, um, they just are because it's the nature of the beast. And when you talk about business and innovation, I think one reason China will always suffer is because, and, and Russia to a certain extent, is because ultimately the government doesn't want people who innovate too much. 
right? That makes people nervous because it m makes the country feel out of control. So people in China, by their nature, don't understand how to innovate in the same way that somebody, say, from the States does. Wow, um, that's a really fascinating insight, you know, because it has a lot of parallels to the technology industry, which people talk about ad nauseum. I'm not sure if you're in those circles, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh, exactly. That, that must be very interesting for you to see, even in the... I think... Yeah, let's go on. I, I think it applies to business, most definitely. And I think it applies to business in Russia, too. Russia has quality control issues, uh, and they're certainly innovative in certain portions of the tech industry. But, um, yeah, there are certain kinds of... the certain ways in which Russia, at this moment, isn't as innovative, because they can't be in China, certainly. And I don't see where that comes to an end for China, uh, it's also one of the reasons they collaborate, as it were, with so many businesses and ask for technology transfers in exchange for access to their marketplace uh, because they they are behind and I don't think they can continue to innovate, although there are some extraordinary scientists there. Yeah, yeah so same thing in the arts. I think there's some great work and it's interesting, but it's a challenge. And if that isn't fostered at the local level, or if you're worried somebody's going to tell on you or turn you in, you don't. You just don't take those risks, right? And and that that kind of defiant attitude that defines the Russian artist or many Russians, right? Russians are defiant in the face of everybody and take great pride in it. And the the Chinese uh, don't have that same hubris. They have a different kind of strength, but not that hubris. Yeah. There's the great in the to comment on your uh, what you said about Russians being defiant to everything, proud of it. There's that great Churchill quote that uh, there is nothing the Russian admires more than strength, and nothing they detest more than weakness. Than weakness, so, yes, yeah, it's true. Which I think, indeed, as a very simplistic aphorism, can explain a lot of the machismo that you might find in the Russian people, especially maybe against homosexuality or in their populism and their nationalist tendencies. Uh, it can it can be sort of, uh, what would you say? It can be drawn back to as, as simple an aphorism as that. No question. Yeah, I, I've, I've heard more Russian women in particular say, well, he's a real man and he's a good man. <laughs> like it's very, you know, very no, clear so linear descriptions. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's respected, sure. Many of the oligarchs, when the when Russia fell, many of the the only structure in place was the mafia, right? Really, because city structures fell and the mafia took over many of the businesses. There were some cities they'll tell you about mafia wars when you visit them. It's extraordinary history. And not all, but many, many people who became very wealthy came from that structure, right? And they took over those industries. And, and now you have a man running the country who needs to manage those people and and has done a good job of it. So, you know, when I say the biggest badass, he's in a group of, of men who grew up in a kind of a, a power vacuum and a power struggle and not a simple one. Um, he took over, what, in 99 and, and kind of brought the country together. And, and to his credit, saved the arts. I mean, people were selling things out of the basement of the Hermitage at that point. And he put an end to that. And he funded kind of the Hermitage and other museums and the arts because he understood their place in Russia's history. And uh, he, he had a lot of strong, at that point, men, although a lot of women too. I mean, one thing to Russia's credit is due to communism, having a female boss isn't a threat at all. But also, the, again, the idea of women being in positions of power at a business is not at all unheard of there. So. Uh, if there was a benefit of communism, perhaps that's it. Okay, well, is there, before we move on to the economics of photography, is there anything <laughs> more interesting uh, that you would like to say about working with so many different cultures and noticing how art is interpreted and thought about in really a nice cross-section of humanity? Sure, I, I think that um, we tend, particularly in the cultural centers, uh, Western cultural centers, and I'll use New York as an example because I spent a lot of time there. Uh, we believe in a certain definition of art, and and we talk about a certain embrace. But I think we're really uh, have a hard time respecting the socio-cultural histories of countries like China or Russia or others, 
and their creative histories and what's led them to where they are now. We, we tend to decide whether they're right or wrong. And I don't think we embrace or, as you said, bathe ourselves in those cultures at all. We visit them. We read about them. But spending time in each of those cultures, you really have a different understanding of why artists create the way they do, their messages are what they are, and how they relate to their own cultural histories. And I, I think we could stand to do uh, with a little greater understanding of that globally. Uh, and not just an embrace of maybe a global, more global definition of art, but a wider range of messages uh, that are true to different creators. Um, and it's just been an extraordinary gift, honestly, to be able to spend that much time in different countries and uh, get out of Moscow and St. Petersburg or get out of Beijing and Shanghai and really see how people live every day in smaller regions, smaller cities. Um, you really learn a lot about creativity and what the arts mean when you get to smaller towns. Yeah, and how, and how, I think the other thing I should say is in the West we take for granted a large middle class and upper class and lower upper class that buy art and for their homes or decorate and those cultural histories don't exist in the majority of the world. There is, there was no middle class in Russia, there is now, but the idea of purchasing art to decorate seems a frivolous thing to most and certainly Russian artists because you're going to buy a foreign artist that has greater standing. So it's it's really hard to develop an art market, kind of a segue to other part of the talk too, it's hard to develop an art market in many countries because there isn't a middle class. And if there is, they don't have the history of decorating or buying or supporting local artists, maybe crafts, but not the arts. And there's great value, and we've certainly in the US and Europe done our, our work to impart that value on kind of Western art, and if you're going to buy it, you want to own that, because that gives you some sort of social capital, either in your town or globally. So it makes it hard for young people, or people of any age in the arts, and Brazil's the same way. I mean, there are any number of countries we could go to that have the same struggle. And we're very lucky uh, to have cultures that kind of support and embrace that, which allows any number of people to be artists to, to varying extents. And I know that you've got an insight into lots of different types of art, whether it's from painting to sculptures to film to more contemporary manifestations of art. But if we could stick it exclusively to photography. Sure. Yep. Um, as you think about the global market for photography, where are the main commercial centers? Where are people buying the most art? Well, the photography at its best is being bought and sold in some of the places you'd imagine, New York and Paris. Uh, Santa Fe is the second largest art market in the U.S., which surprises it, it, yeah. people. If you could actually do it in a descending order, if, if you have that information on hand. Well, I can give you my, my best opinion. I would say New York and Paris because New York has an extraordinary gallery system and Paris does as well, but uh, France historically has a deep embrace for photography, particularly black and white photography. Santa Fe has a large art market. Uh, in New Mexico, which most people don't think of, uh, but they have a number of galleries that are, are quite nice. Very surprising, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then other countries, you know, Germany, Italy, I mean, the majority of Europe embraces photography to a certain extent and collects it, right? But those three cities, I think, are, or those two, New York and Paris, are the centers. And then you can, you can sell work in Miami in the U.S., you can sell work in Los Angeles, you can sell work in San Francisco and do well, but the kind of work is different in each city. And uh, the amount of work that's sold is different. L.A. has a, a strong photography marketplace. San Francisco, with all due respect to my friends in L.A., is probably a little more refined, but sells less work mm. uh, and has fewer galleries doing so. So... Yeah, uh, some of it depends on the marketplace. I'm surprised to hear that, that there isn't a Dubai, a Singapore, a Beijing, you know, a Kuala Lumpur, like these cities in less developed countries that have in them an extraordinarily rich money falling out of their wallets, uh, upper class. 
Uh, I, I'm surp- especially Dubai. I'm just surprised to hear that more if, wouldn't be there. If I'm buying work in Dubai, first, you know, there, there are social cultural issues there as well, right? People are buying work defined in large part by the, their religious beliefs or their cultural beliefs or their personal beliefs. So that will limit the amount and type of work that can be sold there. And then if I have that, if I have that kind of money, uh, I'm probably buying pieces. I'm probably buying paintings or other things that have greater, right? Because that have greater social value, right? Because there isn't a, a deep understanding of photography in those marketplaces. Shanghai, uh, it's same story in a different way, right? You can sell photography there, and there's China has an extraordinary love for photography. On um, Yeah, extraordinary, particularly, and they have giant festivals. So on the level of everyday people, right, people in small towns or cities, small is a relative phrase, right? You're talking million people. Um, There's a great embrace. In Russia, there's a great embrace. But the problem is you don't have a marketplace developed and the photography that's bought is comparably less to these other places. So, sure, you can sell photography in Dubai, but you need to be very aware of what you're selling and to whom and how. Uh, Shanghai would be the same thing. Um, I didn't see a lot of photography there, but I know there are a lot of photographers in China and are making their versions of fine art. Yeah, yeah, there are festivals that are absolutely enormous. Mm-hmm. It just hasn't, it hasn't matured to the, the point that you're buying and selling. Yeah. You know, the gallery system hasn't developed. You're seeing some growth in Brazil. There are a couple of galleries there now. There didn't used to be right. any, right? Um, Mexico yeah. City? Mexico City, not a large gallery system, not a lot of photography bought. Uh, certainly, there's a developing market there. I've had people talk about it a lot over the last two years uh, as a place that's growing. I haven't seen substantive work being sold there. but Africa? I, Lagos, Cape Town... South Africa, South Africa, uh, there's work being sold in South Africa. I, to the best of my knowledge, more local work mm-hmm. and regional work than you're, you're having um, international work flow there. Right. I'm picturing, say, Nairobi. You f- you're a rich Western tourist. You fly in, you're going to the big game parks. You spend the last few nights in Nairobi in some nice hotel. You go to nice restaurants. You go and then you into a gallery which has all the game we've seen over the last few days, but just artfully presented. I, I'm imagining that these would be sort of hyper-local markets, which although might not sell large volume, would, because of the price, be significant markets, you know? This is just well, outside of perspective. But. No, no, that's fine. I would think, I, I would look at it like, yes, if I go to Aspen or Vale or Jackson Hole to ski, there are some galleries there that are selling work of the mountains and the valleys and the nature and the wildlife, right? If I go to a place like Kenya, there are certainly a handful of photographers there who do absolutely gorgeous work. I think a, a great example is Peter Lick, who opened a, you know, his own gallery in Caesar's Palace, and not the best work you're ever going to see, but he presents it well and charges a lot. And people walk in and they're, they say, well, I'm in Caesars and this is this gorgeous space and I get treated very well and put in a little room and all the acrimal and maybe a little champagne. Of course, this picture is worth 10 or 20 grand. You know, and it isn't. Peter is such a fascinating guy, isn't he? I really, really want to interview him because he's an oh, Australian, I- you know, he's a giant personality. And like you say, Everyone has about the same reaction to Peter Lick's work. Like, I wouldn't buy it, but he sells millions of dollars of paint of photos. It's amazing. He well, yeah, yeah. I would take I would take issue with his "I sold the most expensive photo in the world" claim, but <laughs> but uh, but yes, he. But it's all about presentation and marketing, right? It really, truly is. Gorgeous space. I've gone into the a couple of his galleries just to see and the always young women always nice looking always treat you well always you know are completely talk to you like you're now in the hall of greatness and i mean it's it's really an extraordinary experience and then when he i have uh, friends who worked with him and the packaging i guess is amazing so you have this peter lick paper that wraps it and then you have a 
you know, you open the box, which is a Peter Lick box, and you look through the styrofoam and you see this, you know, little whatever it is, sticker or tag that, you know, and he he's smart, man. Every every step of the way, he implies that there's value here. Now, the flip side of that is most of those people believe when they buy it, it's going to appreciate or they can resell it, and that's not the case. I mean, there's no secondary market. There's no secondary market for most most photography, right? Even some well-known photographers. So the secondary market for people who are listening is uh, kind of auction houses or galleries or other places that will resell a piece of work a second or third or fourth or fifth time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you won't see Peter's work going for 20, 30, 40, 50 grand at an auction house. Mm. I don't know if they'll take it at all. Yeah. So... That's that's the flip side of that, but he's an extraordinary marketer, and yes, he's uh, a character, no doubt. A hundred percent. I and that's also part of the sort of dirty commercial questions that I want to ask because Peter Lick, love him or hate him, does an exceptional job at creating income for himself, for his family, for his legacy, for his business, for his brand, and you know if if just simply the fact of the perfect location within a Caesar's palace and you get to feed off all of that free pheromones and dopamine from being gambling, maybe, maybe you had a great day, you know, you're yeah. up 20, 30 K. Oh, I'll, I'll yeah. spare five ten for this lovely landscape photo. You know what yeah. I mean? Like that's, yeah. you got to give him credit for that. I think at yeah, least I that's do. amazing. Yeah, yeah. I do. Um, I don't, uh, yeah. I don't, I think, yeah, he was a visionary in that sense and extraordinary. Whether you like his work or not, he got that right. Mm-hmm. And I, so when you, you want to talk about the commercial side, I think a couple of things are really important. One is you need to find the portion of the fine art market in which your work fits. So I had a friend who always wanted to show up my gallery, but he sold his work at art fairs and he drove around in a van and then he bought a box truck and he had a mobile studio and he lived on the road a lot and spent six months a year in Southeast Asia. And he was making 110, dollars $130,000 a year at one point. So it was a great life for him. He would never have made that if he'd been in a high-end New York gallery auditioning those same prints. So Todd was smart enough to find the portion of the market that worked for him and had the lifestyle he wanted to live, right? And he lived it. Um, Peter... Peter would struggle to sell his work in New York galleries, but he created his own in the right space and he sold it, right? Uh, um, If you're making conceptual work, maybe you're working in the not-for-profit space and you're teaching and you're you're trying to grant fund your work. If you're creating um, landscapes and, and other things along that line, maybe you're looking at galleries like Aspen or Vail or local galleries. There are a lot of local artists in the U.S. and Europe who do quite well quite quite well, better than a lot of national artists. And if you're doing larger scale uh, conceptual work, but it also has, you know, commercial enough appeal, whether people want to admit that or not, you know, there are large galleries that can sell your work in major art centers around the around the world. And then you have the Gagosians and people like that who are in multiple countries and are really corporations and you know managing the art market in an extraordinary way that has never been seen so i think big part of being successful as a photographic fine artist is finding the right market for your work and the right galleries for your work or the right not-for-profit for your work building some visibility because if you don't have some social media or you're not building some visibility in another way you're really not going to find clients, right? You have to do the work. We all would love to imagine we have greatness in our camera uh, and people are just going to discover it. The the other half is just because you spend a lot of time making it doesn't mean anyone has to buy it. And I used to hear that a lot at the gallery when I was a gallerist. Like, you know how long it took me to make this project? And I said, as a person, I have deep respect for that. As a gallerist, I can only sell it for X. Now, the other thing is, in a gallery like mine, it was small, and I could take a chance on people, and it was fun. I mean, it was completely indulgent. We're in New York. We're in the Chelsea Art District. It was great. We're in an arts building. But there were... I couldn't sell portraiture, for instance, but Marvelli Gallery down, two floors down, four floors down. That's all they sold. 
and he could take the same print if it were a portrait and sell it for probably fifteen hundred dollars two thousand dollars four thousand dollars more so some of it depends on the gallery you're in even within the same city or the same street the same building so it's really finding that place and positioning your work in the right way now there were some people who exhibited at my gallery and then moved to a larger gallery and that happens all the time because we had generated enough sales and enough visibility they were given an offer from somebody who could you know we weren't on the first floor they could move down to the first floor which was always the better place to be and I, I wasn't ready I loved being a gallerist but if you want to be a successful gallerist it has to be 24 hours a day seven days a week breakfast lunch dinner and uh, you know I I ran my gallery as a business if it didn't make money I wasn't going to keep it open so to take the risk and I either had to give away the rest of the life, my life to the gallery or I needed to move down to the first floor and take a bigger financial risk or probably both and I wasn't ready to do that it was mm. time to move on yeah it's a shame that uh, quality algorithms and distribution isn't optimized for quality just because you have something that is the best or better than something else is not necessarily going to that's not all you need you need that dirty marketing involved or you're just an exceptionally <laughs> lucky person who manages yeah, to be picked up you know and that you can you can never fully discount the role of luck in something like this um, not at all but yeah i mean that's i mean to to refer to what we started with this sort of generalist uh idea of whatever the modern creative economy is is step one for i think anyone really thinking about this as a as a career or as a way to create a lifestyle is to have that audience is to have someone to leverage your things onto and obviously implicit in that is trust and that it is going to be good and that they actually give a shit about you not just random people right, um, right. but there's this notion of kevin kelly wrote back in the day of, of a thousand true fans uh, just if you if there are a thousand people out there and because of the internet you can find a small niche and find a thousand people who actually really give a shit about what you're doing but you have a thousand true fans you can create a life around that you can create a lifestyle and then hey a thousand true, true. fans is good what if you have ten thousand true fans and so that's kind of how it builds you're pro you might be familiar with a guy called who is a uh, photographer youtuber and i don't know four or five million subscribers something like that and he's not like he, his photos are sort of kind of, I mean, I hope he doesn't watch this, no offense, but it's, it's kind of like stock photography a little bit, you know, yeah. like the, yeah, there aren't sure. things that stop you like Salgado might, you know, or right. like uh, right. Amy Vitale or Paul Nicklin. Like, you know, I, I particularly like wildlife landscape, which is why they're the ones in mind, but there aren't these photos that just, you know, like that cannot be captured again, type reactions. Right. Instead, it's like beautiful. If I had a camera on that point at that day, I also would have taken that photo. So, but has of four, five million subscribers within that, maybe a hundred, 200,000 people that will buy his stuff no matter what it is. And so he is, you know, like the best example for me, at least of someone within or David Yarra, some within the photography community who's just smart, really, really smart, building an audience first, selling the things onto them later. Um, well, and, and, and early adapters in that field, right? It's much harder to create that audience now than it was 10 years ago, five years ago. Well, I think in terms of photography, there's so many more people out there trying to teach people how to photograph things or uh, there's so much more imagery to consume that it's harder to get to aggregate that many people. Uh, although I do think you can create a niche audience and build a career around it. Uh, and it does help with a gallery if you have you know, an Instagram following. It just helps, it's marketing and promotion. And a gallery, a lot of people wonder why they need galleries. A gallerist has a network of contacts that they've spent hopefully their whole lives developing that you now get to benefit from. Mm. And you know, if they can walk your work into a museum or they can walk your work into a collector or they can get your work uh, written about, I think that's, that's hugely helpful. Um, when you talk about just being purely commercial, yeah, you, you do need to develop an audience and you need to develop some visibility. Um, 
again, depending on where you want to sell your work, it depends on the content of the work, like you're saying. There's a lot of very solid, very average work that the majority of people in the world are going to say, that's a really beautiful image. And there's a place for that, mm. right? And it makes a lot of people angry that those folks have success. Mm. Uh, probably angrier that they hold themselves up as maybe the best of, but uh, it's another story. But I think uh, it depends on where you're aspiring to in that, in that hierarchy, right? And what part of the art market you choose isn't hierarchical. Choosing what's going to allow you to be most successful and have the lifestyle you want and perhaps to make some money is a smart choice. What's hierarchical is the global galleries, you know, that kind of have so much clout and then the higher end contemporary galleries that sell things for hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. And then you move down that food chain and, you know, is a, is a gallery in Chicago as good as a gallery in New York? Probably, probably not. You know, is one in Milwaukee have as much clout as one in San Francisco? Probably not. Right. So there's that hierarchy in the world too, but it doesn't mean that local artists can't make a lot of money selling locally in those galleries. So it really just depends on, like I said earlier, finding your place. And I don't think marketing is a dirty word. I think, you know, creating visibility is part of what we do. I think it's very idealistic as an artist to imagine that I just get to sit in my studio and create. I mean, Picasso certainly didn't do that. He was out there all the time working with his, deal, his art dealer and other people and meeting collectors. And I, I think there's a kind of a fantasy we built around that idea that the artist just sits in their studio and slaves away and yeah, but, somebody sells but it. The- There really is, I think at least, and like I started with, you know, I'm very commercially minded, uh, totally okay, but there is an inauthenticity to advertising and it's just inescapable and it's because of the amount of shit that is sold to us all the time and we're told it's the best, we're told it's going to do X, Y, and Z and it repeatedly fails our expectations. And so people become very jaded to selling. People hate being sold to, right? the best marketing guy ever, the best salesman ever, makes you think you wanted the product. You, you, you know, I had nothing to do with this, right? And that's, there's many great examples of that, terrific examples. One of the best salesmen I ever worked with, Garrett Hiscano, earned stupid amounts of money. And he was small, meek, he smoked a lot of weed, he had such a softly spoken voice. No one ever thought that that he was selling something to them, yet they always bought off him. It was like a true thing of beauty to see. And um, But anyway, and that's what also great marketing does, good advertising. But basically, I do think there is an inauthenticity to marketing and advertising, and therefore it does become a dirty word, especially among the pure, the purest art community who, you know, ex- exclusively speak in emotional language types, you know, I, I can really see where they're well, coming from. It's like being an anti-capitalist artist who's upset that you don't have a gallery. Right? I mean, <laughs> exactly. You know what I mean? It's, exactly. there's a duality there. There's, yeah, there's a totally. difference between hawking your wares, right? There's a difference between hawking your wares and creating visibility for yourself. Right. And that's a conversation I have with people all the time. There's a difference between advertising or doing sales. And if that's what you do with your work, that's up to you. And, you know, but and making creating visibility through social media that's honest. Here's my work. Here's what I do. Here's where I travel. Here's what I think, you know, mm-hmm. um, and, I, and you have to have visibility. Right. I, every artist has to have a certain visibility. So you don't need to be again, trying to sell your stuff, pushing it. Sometimes I think that often demeans the work. You know, there are a lot of art marketplaces online where they'll tell you it's Valentine's Day, put your prints for sale, you know, put up your romance. I find that, you know, tasteless, but I know a lot of people who love those sites because they feel they're aggregating audience. I don't think they really aggregate an art audience um, and they make a lot of money for people. I don't think they make a lot of money for most people who are selling their work on them. Um, it's my opinion, but yeah, so I think it's, it's how you're looking at that idea of marketing and promotion. And I, th- I, I prefer to look at the idea of creating visibility for an artist and visibility in the areas that they want to inhabit or succeed in. Right. And I might want to work in the not-for-profit space and hope to have a museum career. I still have to create some visibility or I'm never going to be in that space. That curator is never going to know who I am. Just to return to a second on the geographic spread of where things are sold, David Yarrow speaks how in Dallas, for example, 
it's he'll sell more photos of big game, you know, the elephants, the lions, etc., than he would anywhere else in the world. And how the top ten cities in America all will sell more than say London, you know, by far the top selling city in the United Kingdom. Certainly, most of Europe, maybe excluding Paris, maybe Ven- um, Milan as well. Uh, uh, but that's quite interesting, isn't it? So. Could you comment on that and then also a hierarchy of photography and the subjects, how they sell? So what sells the most? Is it fashion photography? Is it wildlife photography? Is it historical photography? I don't know. Well, uh, it speaks to the people in the marketplace and the personality of the people, right? So what might sell in Miami might, you know, in general, you find art in Miami to be more brightly colored and you know, pleasurable and it goes to the lifestyle. High saturation. Yeah. 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 And in, you know, and in Dallas and a handful of other places where people, you know, perhaps hunt big game or imagine it or like that idea, you know, you're going to be able to sell that work. Uh, As a general rule, documentary photography is a tough sell. Uh, Fashion photography is an art form is a tough sell. Although people like Richard Avedon, Helmut Newton, you know, Irving Penn, sell for extraordinary amounts of money justifiably so peter Lindbergh. so there is the idea of fashion as art that's growing that generally sells in larger metropolitan areas but that i mean you know if you look at newton or Lindbergh or any of those folks uh sarah moon they'll sell in la san francisco new york london paris milan any city so if if people love that style of work it sells well but it it you won't see a lot of people buying fashion and putting it in their home uh it just it's just not the kind of work that sells so it's a niche but one that does very well Mm -hmm. um nature landscapes sell more broadly than anything else because they they can be sold so that's the best one well they won't sell okay so it's a difficult question because there's a hierarchy right if you're not going to see larry gagosian or some of the larger you know, contemporary photo galleries selling a lot of landscape. They're making their money on work that's far more conceptual. You know, uh, artists Erwin Olaf or other artists, Cindy Sherman, certainly aren't creating landscapes, but they're creating work that's both intriguing and conce- deeply conceptually based and, you know, and has an allure in terms of aesthetics. Uh, landscape is the most easily consumed work, so you can sell it at multiple levels of the gallery system and more cities so it's you you can't you can't take it as a a or b because landscape sells more because you can sell it at more price points and more places to more people but it's harder to sell at the highest end of the gallery system because you need to imbibe that landscape with you know like you, you can be Anders Kursky and sell photographs of hotels in the Prada store and the 99 cent store and sell them for millions of dollars. Well, part of that's because he has a history. He's created a history of work that builds on a specific concept or ideas that's evolved over time. And the work is gorgeous and it's engaging and he limits the additions and he, his gallery manages it very well. So could you say we should all be out there doing pictures of hotels and and Prada stores? No, you can't. But you could argue that it's some of the best-selling work because it makes a lot more money. So it, it depends on whether you're talking about volume and accessibility. You know, nature photography is tough. Uh, selling pictures of, of animals and animals in nature, it's hard. You know, the, you need to be in areas where people consume that for their homes. So maybe you're in Florida and you're selling a certain type of landscape and animal like you said Dallas big game or you're in you're in Jackson Hole and people want to see you know bear or buffalo or whatever they're going to see in the wild right and they want to have that in their home so it depends on market it re- it really does but it, but selling photographs of wildlife is is a general rule tougher because so many people do it so few people do it so very well and a handful of people have a lock on a, a rather large portion of the market. It's like working for National Geographic, right? I have friends like, I want to work for Nat Geo. That's great, but they have such a catalog at this point that if 
that photo of a cougar doesn't look dated, they probably don't need another one unless it's extraordinary. Right, so the things they used to send people out for, they don't have to send people out for as often anymore. It's the same thing, you know, in, in the gallery world. What, what we're attracted to and what we want in our home or our office is different. And in terms of corporate, no sex, no religion, no politics. So you can sell any number of things in a corporate space, but it opens people up, particularly in the U.S., to lawsuits. So that makes the sale of other work Litigious much easier. bastards. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so you can't, you, well, somebody at work is offended by the artwork you put up, you know, you're in trouble if it's sexual, religious, or political in nature. Yeah, I get it. You can be offended by the landscape, but that's a whole other story. That's just a difference in taste. You can't sue mm. over that, mm-hmm. you know. And, you know, I think the other thing that's important to remember is there are a lot of people who are helping people build collections, you know. There are some collectors who have extraordinary taste, but just having money doesn't equal great taste. Mm-hmm. So you have all sorts of work being sold at a very high price point. Not often, um, because it's great work. In what you say there, there is so much zero to one in photography and art. Are you familiar with Peter Thiel's idea of zero to one? No, it's that. It's uh, it's a it's a no, it's a way to think about innovation. Basically, you can have zero to one, which is the creation of something new, right? Or you can have one to n, you know, anywhere in the million iterations between that. So, for example, something new might be capturing an elephant with in a beautiful landscape that no one else has done it before. Great, that's an original, and then. And all the iterations after that is hmm. the next hundred photographers who come and take that exact same photo with it, with their own touch, right? They're equally elegant, whatever, but it's an, it's an iteration of what was already created. Or for example, um, I don't know his name. He's got an exhibition at Photographisca at the moment in Stockholm. He's a portrait photographer of celebrities, but he, he like scratches the photos and, and then cuts out things and pastes them on top of it. It's um, not my style, but it's, I can totally see it's a style and it's clearly him. Like that's a great innovation from him to do that. It, it's clearly him when you see it. Anyway, so it strikes me there's a lot of this notion of zero to one and the whole point of it, because you think about it in a business sense, the value, the immense value is captured in that zero to one. You can create value on one of the iterations after, no doubt. But if you want to be in the in the tail end distribution, you want to be in that zero to one phase. So yeah, it's the same. So what do we do then? Or what do I do as an amateur photographer? Where do you see zero to one opportunities? <laughs> and maybe you're just giving away the playbook there, but just in case you see anything. <laughs> well, no, I, don't, I don't think it's giving away the playbook because your zero to one is going to be very different than mine. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the beauty and the, and the trauma of being a photographer is where do you find that? Well, uh, some people are going to find that in their personal lives or their concept. If you're talking about nature photography, that's a little more difficult. You know, mm-hmm. you're going to have to probably spend a few months in Kamchatka and the in the you know old growth forest and and uh, make it happen right you have to you have to sacrifice mm-hmm. uh, if I'm a conceptual photographer how do you create something that's conceptually new and fresh or socially new and fresh that's at zero to one right that resonates as authentic or is purely a construct right like the like the portrait photographer you're talking about the celebrity photographer his work is a construct maybe an honest one, but it's a construct. So how do I come up with a construct that defines me? And I know that sounds like a nebulous answer is you need to find kind of your your voice or your zero to mm-hmm. one in your area. But depending on what you want to take on, uh, you need to do that. It's a much harder thing to do than you imagine only because, well, A, it's hard to find, but B, whenever you're groundbreaking, and particularly as a visual artist, and you're creating something that's outside of that consumable mainstream or the approved contemporary concept if you're creating what's next you're going to be the odd person out and you're going to get a lot of flack because people are going to say man that's not very good or i don't get it or and i say to students all the time as a teacher my job is to teach you to grow past me and you should i have a nice career it's great but if you need to creating what's next and if you're not creating some work that your professors, your teachers don't understand from time to time, I don't think you're doing your job. 
unless you want to work in the the great excuse me the great middle where there's nothing wrong with that right making work and making a living there's absolutely nothing wrong with that but if you aspire to be that zero to one that that groundbreaking person you're gonna have to make some stuff that a lot of people are gonna disagree with just because it's it's not what they're comfortable with or it's not what they make or it's not what we understand is conceptual or beautiful yet but once you do then you're that person, right? You're the you're the person we imagine being, and um, not everybody. Look, people love approval. People love sales. People love uh, you know pats on the back from their colleagues and their professors. And to stand strong in the face of that is hard. So, yeah, to if you're if you're photographing nature, it's I think it's time and sacrifice. And if you're photographing other kinds of portraiture or conceptual work, it's taking the risk that either you're going to hit or you're not. And we looked at a book. There's a great example. I was uh, I got my photo degree at Art Center, College of Design in Pasadena. And we were with a professor, and we were looking at uh, an old book of photos from like five years prior, and there was a photographer we loved. We're like, oh, my gosh, where is this guy? What's he doing? And she said, he's out of business. We said, what do you mean? His work is amazing. And she said, he was five years too soon. And she was right. I mean, he was creating the work that we were aspiring to. He got it. He either just didn't m understand how to move that into the mainstream or move it into a series of clients or people just weren't ready for it. And I think that happens to a lot of people, not to, not to bring things down, but I think you have to be very brave in that. Yeah, I mean, for sure it would happen to the majority of people, right? It's very likely that the best photos and paintings ever taken and and painted, you know, are on like their friend's wall because they had to give it away. You know, I, I really think that's probably the case. The same with great books. For sure, some of the greatest novels ever written sold a thousand copies and it was never printed again. And the best essays ever written are right now on somebody's blog that gets zero traffic. So... Um, yeah, yeah, books, it, it, books that couldn't make it past an editor, and that doesn't make every that exactly. doesn't make every book that's turned down good. <laughs> let's, let's be clear, you know, just because you're rejected doesn't mean you're genius. But there's a lot of work. That, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's a lot of work that, whether it's in the fine arts or writing or anywhere else, that there's a commercial side. I explain this about publishing all the time. It's a business. My gallery was a business, whether people yeah. like that or not it had I had to survive I had to yeah. feed myself you know yeah. so it's it's the same thing they're gatekeepers for a reason and then people like gatekeepers because they filter work for them right yeah. galleries are a filter and people despite the argument I see that photographers want to democratize work and sell it directly and there are ways to do that um, even NFTs there are galleries that are going to be the gatekeepers for those because collectors want somebody else to help them understand what's good and what has the potential to enter. Um, yeah, it's, it's the nature of the beast, right? Not everybody wants to. You transitioned me perfectly there because e-commerce and NFTs is something I definitely want to touch. How can fine art photography be done better through e-commerce? Well, fine art photography through e-commerce is generally a mass marketplace which I don't think most image makers understand. It's either to create visibility or to generate sales. And those sales can from time to time be a few thousand dollars. Or it was like my friend, he could sell things at four or five grand at an art, art fair, you wouldn't imagine. You're generally looking at volume. Um, so e-commerce allows that. The problem is there's so much of it out there. Even if you go to a, a site that aggregates fine art, there's so much work there. How do you create a niche? How do you create visibility? How do you, or how do you, as you said, you, you find a thousand dedicated followers and make that 5,000 and create your, create your own world online and have a nice living. You could do that. Um, NFTs, I, I hear people say, you know, they're going to fall apart. Everyone's going to get ripped off. I have people say it's, you know, Nirvana for artists. I, you know, I think uh, all of that's true. I think most NFTs are going to be worthless. I think people are just learning about the marketplace. I think they're better suited for gaming and right now people in the gaming sphere anime sphere uh i know some people are selling photographs for 
reasonable amounts of money, NFTs. Mm -hmm. um, how long that lasts? I think there'll be a mass market for that at uh, one level, and I think you'll have um, collectors at another level, and then you'll have NFTs managed through galleries, of course, because it's just another form. Uh, and it, it'll exist in some form. Digital photography should be bought and sold. And then, you know, you could question whether at some point the big money will be in NFTs for my digital home in the Metasphere on a certain game, right? Like Nike just bought a company that sells NFT shoes because people will spend money on the shoes for their avatar before they'll buy them for themselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that might be silly or at some point it might be real. I don't know. But yeah. so that potential exists. I think the other potential that exists in not e-commerce, but online is again, generating audience. There's a, and, and, ex, and when things open up again, experiences. So there's a, a young woman who paints very photorealistic paintings. No gallery will manage her, but she puts on these kind of, it's like the museum of ice cream. You know, she puts on these events where like you had to go through a giant bouncy room to get in. And then the first 10,000 people got a free pair of socks and, you know, and then, but she sold out an edition. I, I'm not going to get the edition size right. So I'm, I'm I don't want to, don't quote me. I don't, you know, look it up, but I think her editions were editions of 20 and then she had some more editions of a hundred and she made, you know, tens of thousands of dollars at each of these events, hundred thousand dollars at each of these events and has created a following and then she'll make paintings that she sells for much more. So she's used the idea of the online space, bring it into an experiential space to create audience and drive sales in a different way. And then she, you know, opened up an online store once she had certain audience and visibility and she can sell there and it makes sense. Mm. But I think the idea of e-commerce as the great democratizer um, and NFTs as a great democratizer is overblown. We have greater access, um, but to generally a mass audience, unless you as an individual can curate a higher end, more exclusive audience and sell direct, right? Yeah. So, you know, the other thing that you have access to, if you can curate that audience are, you know, corporations and places like that, that have some money for our collections you know, and you have a, an online space, but they're not going to be searching websites for art. You still need to go out and, you know, you can consider bad, but you still need to reach out to those people if you want to be in corporate collections, unless you're a very well-known name or a gallerist reaches out to them for you. To, to take the devil's advocate position on the necessary role of the gallery, um, because uh, as I have heard you say in other speeches, not speeches, talks, um, but then as well, just generally the consensus, the gallery is super necessary because the ultimate consumer can see the final product on a wall and that makes it so much more real for them and that makes it justify the value in their own head a lot more than as you say, the gallery person, whether it's you or one of your staff can explain and add the sales on top of it. Well, this artist is actually a refugee who came here with just a camera and no money in his pocket. And now look what he's creating, you know, that also adds the value to it. So if I take the devil's advocate argument on that, and that is the role of the gallery in the world of NFTs, in the world of infinite distribution via the internet, in the world of much better virtual reality technology, why could a gallery not become entirely virtual? And so you can have that exact same experience simply through your computer. That is better for the artist, clearly, because it's lower cost for them, it's lower risk for them. Um, it's wider distribution for the gallery. You know, your gallery that you used to have in the great part of Chelsea, New York, is now no longer only available to the people that happen to walk by. The entire world can come and look at it, so it's kind of better all around. Um, do you see this reality ever coming into fruition? And even if it did, do you think it would be as successful as the promise might claim it to be? Uh, I think certainly it, in some form will come to fruition. Just like, you know, all of a sudden everybody had a website and uh, all of a sudden everybody has Insta. Yeah, I think at some point there will be virtual galleries, already are, for a number of spaces. Um, I think the, the flip side of that is the need to be, why do galleries hate art fairs? Why do they go? Because I might pay 
hundred thousand dollars to be there and another hundred thousand dollars to ship this artwork and then I've got to go to X number of dinners or I've got to host an event to get collectors to come uh, that kind of experience that collectors are paying for knowing the gallerist being part of that world seeing the work in person feeling a certain ambiance there's a group of people at a certain level who are going to want that right and there's societal capital so there's social capital at a certain level do I think that uh, our individual artists will be able to set up their own galleries and make sales no question and can smaller galleries like mine or others will they have virtual spaces sure will that be exactly the same as seeing the artwork in person no and will that matter to people probably to a lot of people it won't but to a handful of people it will and I would guess yeah and at the higher end there will be both there will be people who will just trust you as a gallerist and buy it you know, I, I think we it'd be pretty tough to get into the art if you don't like it, return it business. Um, <laughs> you know, so I think that's a little tougher than it is if you're buying a pair of shoes or, you know, jeans. Mm. But, mm. but um, yeah, sure, That'll t- there will be a place for that. I don't think, I think without question. And probably a growing marketplace. And then the idea of having a physical space or maybe you don't have a physical space but you do art fairs or you do pop-ups or whatever i think yeah yeah those things will have a an evolving role it's it's like you know where bookstore is going to go away people thought they were now all of a sudden there's a comeback thank goodness sure. yeah you know yeah so we we like it and i and there's always a pushback to technology so you have a generation of people embrace it because it's new and it's cool and that other stuff is old and why do i want it and then you get a little farther down the road and I'm used to technology, maybe it's not so cool, and you know what, it'd be cool to sit there with a book in a coffee shop, or, you know, at home, and that is different, because everything I do is on my phone, or my my iPad, or my laptop, so, yeah, I think there's a place for that, painting didn't die, photography, when I was at Parsons, you know, the idea of working in the darkroom almost disappeared, we had to fight for alternative processes, and now there's some of those popular classes in places, so people want to make sienna types and tin types and they want to do silver prints and you know teaching somebody how to load film in a camera and develop it as magic for a lot of people it's very tactile so yeah it has a place not that it's going to go back to what it was but it has a place and nor should it go back to what it was quite frankly i think that's that's romance you know yeah. i think uh what all this preamble and all my questions have been is kind of tiptoeing around what the true question is, which is just everything about the price or the success of an artist comes down to the perfect pricing X axis between what's your artificial scarcity and then what's your price. So what's your limited edition prints and what's your price where that meets the trying to find that perfect balance. But then also just artificial value, you know, Picasso is worth millions and millions and millions and millions because of this artificial value that we've come together and agreed that it sold for 20 million last year. So it must be worth 25 million this year because Picasso's dead. He can't produce anymore. I suppose there's real scarcity there. Maybe it's not the best example, but no, it's, it's if you walk example. in... But yeah, but you know what I'm trying to get at. I mean, ultimately, it all comes down to this artificial value versus artificial scarcity. That is what determines the price at the end of the day. And um, if you could speak to that a little bit, how do you determine the perfect artificial scarcity? Yeah, I think I think the, the flip side of Picasso are people who bought Impressionists. And over the last 20 years, Impressionists have fallen out of favor. So unless you have one of the great Impressionist paintings or painters, you've lost millions of dollars owning Impressionist painting because people just don't want it anymore. They don't think it's cool. Old masters, the old master painting market is struggling. That's extraordinary painting there. Extraordinary craft and talent. That market's struggling because people just aren't collecting them anymore. There isn't Mm -hmm. the idea of owning that societally or personally or, you know, so that isn't what you think of when you want to have a collection. We don't have that same gravity anymore. So our, our constructs of value shift in the art world. And the same thing happens for artists. If I'm an individual artist and I want to, 
I want to sell. I would, I'll go back to first, it's defining your marketplace, right? Not just making a price point in a print, but finding the place that it, you hope it will sell the best and doing your job to get it to that place. And I would say you're always selling a print. You're not selling a matted print, a frame print. Your cost basis should be just the print and you're, that should be what you're charging and then everything else is added on. Photographers are awful, awful business people. We'll give away the frame, we'll give away the mat, we'll give away this because someone wants to buy it. I mean, really, and it's, it's absurd. Nobody else does that. So you have a print, additioning it creates scarcity and it does create a value proposition. So like generally you raise your price through the addition. So the person who buys the first one pays the least and the person who buys the 10th one pays the most. And that oh, makes okay. everybody else who bought feel better. The pers- yeah. first one pays the least because they took the greatest risk. The 10th one has nine other people validating that print nice. and buying it. I love that. And the, so, and the price isn't set beforehand, right? That's, that's dynamic. Not for me. I, I never worked that way. Perhaps there okay. are people who have that price preset, but for me, I think you needed to react to the marketplace. So mm-hmm. we had one artist who was selling through addition in the, in the one month that we had the show up. And we had that price going up weekly. And it, it, by the end, in larger increments than I would have imagined. Um, and then if, if there's an artist that isn't selling through, well, maybe you don't raise the price much until you get some momentum there. Right? I, think, I think it's important to be a little flexible. So no, I never preset the price in terms of increments. I know some people do. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that, that idea, and then if that value goes from 800 to 1400 or $1,600, well, all those people and everybody they've told about it are going to be more interested in buying images at your next show or the next body of work that you release because, well, the work's gone up, the work's sold. So that makes people excited, right? And you could call that marketing. You can call it basic economics and scarcity. You could, you know, it isn't, uh, I have photographers who hate the idea that they can't sell as many as they want of their favorite print. You can but don't pretend it's an addition. You can do whatever you want, <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't mean you can you be want. in certain parts of the art market, right? right yeah, so yeah. certain parts of every business function in certain ways. You can do whatever you want. It just means you can't function in certain parts of the market. Hmm. So, you know, I don't think additioning is a bad thing. I think you can probably make as much selling 10 or 12 of a print, which is hard to do, as you would selling 50. Mm-hmm. You know, unless you're at like, I'll use my friend unless you're at an art fair or you're at a place where you're constantly selling and you need unlimited numbers yeah he never should addition anything he never never should it didn't make any sense but for most artists selling a, a handful and then increasing the price i think makes more sense and you move on to the next body of work photographers are awful about that too we expect a sculptor or a painter to create a body of work and think of how long it takes to create a good painting or a good sculpture we can go out and we can shoot thousands of frames and go out every day and we get upset when people say, well, I'm, you know, maybe you should make some new work. Well, what do you mean? But well, we expect that of other artists. So, uh, and it's not easy to make great photography. It's not easy to make good photography sometimes. But I think we need to hold ourselves to that and continue to make. The other thing photographers struggle with is building a cohesive body of work and building off of that, whether it's a similar genre or a similar concept or a similar idea and letting that evolve through their career. Mm -hmm. Because if you do, that gives gravity to your price point. So if you're talking about the perfect price point or how you want to price it, if if my work is not the same work every time, but if I'm evolving and building off an idea, a concept, or a type of work, and my work improves, there's pricing, there's pricing power there. There's value in that. There's value as an artist, in any artist, whether you're Picasso or, or someone else. You know, Picasso has that value because museums have validated it, collectors validated it, the auction houses validate it with every sale, and that value will be there. I think it'll be there for Picasso forever, but for many artists, it's there until, quite frankly, it isn't. You know, and, and once people decide they're not into Impressionist paintings, those paintings aren't worth as much. When people decide they are or not worth, not into certain kinds of photography, that disappears. I was at an auction where, oh, I can't I think, uh, the gentleman who photographed uh, Indians across the American West. I can see the painted pictures and I can, his name is right there. Anyway, Watkins, Carlton Watkins. 
Anyway, his work had been selling for just minimal amounts, and and it was worth a lot more. But at this particular auction, two museums both decided they wanted this collection of uh, a folio of like seventy five or hundred images, and it sold for tens of thousands of dollars more than anybody had estimated. And the auction house went crazy, and people loved sitting in the room. And but it was amazing. It was that moment where that work's value shifted because the museums realized the value, collectors realized the value, and it was just one of those moments. And from that point on, his work sold for substantively more, deservedly so. But you could get, you can get a Lee Friedlander print for a couple thousand dollars, is that right? Probably not, as he's a genius, but it's out there. Right? You can get prints from Magnum. Magnum has print sales for a couple hundred bucks, is that right? Those are legendary photographers. You could argue yes, you could argue no, right? It, so the value proposition of different work is is uh, tough. It depends on the moment where you are, the city you're in, mm. um, and and how consistently you continue the the nature of photographers you speak of, consistently create great work that allows them to exist at that level yeah. over time, right? There's it's like uh, yeah. Again, the market's not optimized for quality as the highest outcome. The market's more optimized for the mix of whatever the artificial value might be, whatever the mood of the moment might be, um, all the social capital that might come along with a certain artist might be, and all the rest. All of that. What also quality is a, you know, it's 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 like the photographer you mentioned whose work looks like stock photography. There's quality to that work. Should that be what we're buying for our walls? So the idea of how the who optim who decides what the optimal quality is. I can, I can look at a photographer like that and say it's great tech. I don't know his work, so I'm just, but I can say it's great technique or nice technique and well done. And, you know, those are all good things. Somebody else might say that's extraordinary. I aspire to that. Somebody else might say, oh, I want that in my living room. Right. So the idea of quality is a, a strange arbiter because you can, you can argue then the quality of a concept, right? Because a lot of people pay for a concept. A lot of people pay for the evolution of an idea. So, you know, you can have a book like Tulsa where Teenage Lust, where you're photogra- 35 millimeter cameras photographing people intimate, intimately, and then you get to Nan Golden who are photographing people in color with a snapshot aesthetic, very different, but also photographing the edges of culture intimately. intimately. Well, her talent gives her work value, but also the idea that she's building on uh, something that's there and maybe putting her own like you would say zero to one to it she's giving her own perspective so it's something that's been done but she's brought a different social and visual perspective to it the art market values that it values uniqueness it values newness it values trends for better or for worse and those trends come and go and money comes and goes with it right uh it values any number of things um so it it's it, if you want to use the quality arbiter, that's hard. It reminds me, it just made me think of the beginning of um, Dead Poet Society, where, you know, here's the Pritchard scale. Name the quality of the poem based on these three things. And, you know, you had to chart out the... I think there's a danger to that in the arts. Yeah. Um, you can argue that it's subjective, and perhaps it should be, because your quality might not be mine and might not be my neighbor's. Certainly not. Yeah, certainly not. Yeah, and you know, much to my chagrin, usually, but <laughs> but I think that's okay. It's it's just hard for artists. I just want to make a comment though. Uh, pro NFTs. I don't really know anything about it. I recorded a podcast with a guy who is very very deep in the field um, of NFTs to try and understand them better for myself. And one of the great things for the artist in the NFTs is that they have a rolling commission on resell. So for example, one of your old artists who um, was your client at the gallery, even though you no longer represent him, if his work, her work is resold again and again and again, and one day she, one day she blows up and she's got a 10, 15% royalty commission, that because it's on the blockchain continues to come back to her. And I think that in itself could be rather revolutionary for for an artist, right? Imagine if you were in Picasso, Picasso, great example. You're, you're in somehow you are part of Picasso's estate and next year, private artist buys it for 30 million. 
you, you sweep 10% right off the top of that back into the estate. I, I, I don't know. You know, that's that's kind of revolutionary, isn't it? Well, that would have to be part of the agreement, right? And if if uh, if it and it'll it'll have to see whether the market bears that, right? Whether right. that makes it through the gallery system and the auction system, uh, and then do you have to find the artist? Do you not? Um, you know, I think it'll the idea is there, the ability to follow it and trace it is there, but it'll be interesting to see whether that makes it through the business construct and. Uh, of the industry, mm-hmm. yes, but I agree. It would be revolution. It would be revolutionary. But it's like Hollywood. People get residuals, but then on streaming, all of a sudden they're fighting because they're saying, "Well, that isn't a broad release, so maybe you don't get residuals on streaming because we signed your contract on theatrical release." Mm-hmm. So the the battle between kind of business and the artist's ability to continue to make money off of it is tough. If you can if you can build your own series of NFTs on blockchain. And, and somehow reap a percentage of every resale, that'd be amazing. Or if you could get the art world to take that on, that would be amazing. But you need business to say yes. Mm. And I think some collectors would say yes, many. I think every artist would say yes. And then it depends on whether you can build around the gallery system and create enough momentum or whether you could get the gallery system to buy into it in the museum system, the auction houses. Because that's really where you're talking about the handful of people who really do make it to an auction house. And the majority of work is never sold on the secondary market. Final one on the economics. Talk to me a little bit about David Yarrow's commercial success and what you what stands out to you from that. I don't. I, I mean, David Yarrow, the nature work. It's funny, you're the, you're the second person who's brought his name up in the last month. Um, I think there are a handful of people like, like David who, actually the third, who have positioned themselves well within that marketplace. Um, whether I love the work or not, it's, it's, doesn't matter. Uh, there are a handful of people I, who really do, and people mm-hmm. like to buy it and collect it. I think he's found a balance between taking some nice photographs and marketing them very, very well and establishing himself in a certain portion of the marketplace as an expert or as the person that people should buy this stuff from until somebody else comes in and takes a portion of that market. Mm. And not a lot of people in his field focus on that, although two people I've spoken to in the last month aspire to. Uh, and I think there's, I'm surprised, not any commentary on David. I'm surprised at some of the numbers I'm hearing, but I don't see them evidenced in the auction numbers. So when you hear stories about an artist and not saying what he's saying is right or wrong and just saying, but when you hear a story about any artist, take a look at the secondary market and the auction numbers on your own. So you can see what things are selling for on the secondary market. Uh, and you can look all that up. You can look up an artist and you can see what they're selling for. I think that's really helpful. It'll be helpful for you in terms of setting price and such as well. Um, taking into account that the auction house takes a percentage of that and taking into account the fact that if I own a gallery, we're splitting whatever we're selling 50-50, right? That's a standard split. Um, so I think it's about creating a body of work that if you're looking at David that takes on nature but differentiates you from him and marketing into that niche that he's got a hold of um, but he's I, I don't want to use the Peter Lick analogy because the people might be offended or not he might be or not but he's he's done a great job of marketing yeah and I, oh he, he definitely has yeah and I think that's where that success comes from uh, there are a lot of amazing nature photographers but they aren't as adamant or as uh, focused on marketing to the, for the same kind of sales. Mm. No, what what David Yarrow, I, I think I see him as like a super inspiring character as someone who can uh, market themselves very well as a photographer because, I mean, his photography is amazing. Like, you know, it, but it is wildlife photography, right? It, it, 
It's mm -hmm. about being in the right place. It's about taking the right photo. Um, and that might be kind of cynical uh, way to look at things, but I mean, that's how I see it at least. You know, the mm -hmm. wildlife photographer's key competitive advantage is having the resources to get into the right spot. Uh, hmm. which which separates you from different type of artists. The key competitive advantage of a sculptor, right, is how right. actually good he can sculpt, for example. Anyway, um, you know, if various, and he, he credits uh, a lot of his success to just having a very extensive gallery of networks, um, doing the right due diligence on getting into the right galleries. Uh, he's also, I think, now like a celebrity in his own right, which means there's that added sort of artificial value that is attached to his work cash uh, you know, sure. yeah he's a he's a, he's a celebrity right he he photographs celebrities and i think all of this sort of builds um on top of each other to to explain the sort of commercial success but um i don't know for, for me just to project myself into the chat a bit much yeah, I sure. never thought about photography at all until a couple of years ago where I saw Sebastian Salgado's Genesis shot then I got the book went through his work and just became fascinated in this guy I thought it was I think he's taken some of those amazing photos ever and then I looked into a bit more photography and was just sort of jaded by uh, the type of characters that were that were photographers right they weren't like me really and then I saw David Yarrow and then I thought, oh my God, this is a guy who I, you know, I would like to be like that, for example, right? He's, um, he's a fantastic storyteller, a very charismatic guy, um, has worked in finance and has a very non nonsensical business approach to his career. But at the same time, he's not a sellout, right? I mean, anyway, that's, that's where I'm coming from as a sort of background is why maybe I'm bringing him up in this chat a lot and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, no, it makes sense. But I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head, right? He, he found his market. He worked hard to market to those niches. He has a gallery network and he has positioned himself as sort of a, a name in that, that area of the field, right? And certainly a name to people who are buying that work. Um, you know, he has a lot of competition if you're looking at the Nat Geo people and the people who photograph that mm. stuff. There are a lot of big names out there and a lot of a lot of talent. Uh, names that people in the industry might not know, maybe collectors wouldn't. So he's positioned himself well in terms of that. And you're right, there's certain cachet. He certainly has a following. Mm. And people love it and they want to emulate it. So mm. yeah, he's 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 done that well. You gotta give him. You gotta give him credit. And people too would argue: Is it the best work? Is it not? Is it your favorite work? Well, but that's the subjective argue. nature of art and photography, right? You know, I went through a exhibition in the Photographic Photographiska Museum, and it was a nudist exhibition. And um, I I do see how nudist art can be done very tastefully and elegantly, but it was just trying too hard. You know, it was just is just put the vagina in the weirdest place you can put the penis in the weirdest place you can make this make this a scene that makes you a little bit uncomfortable and i understand that some people value that very highly right um, but that's the subjective nature of it i guess sometimes when you stick you tape a banana to the wall and you start taking the piss out of the world that is a bit too much but again there's 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 enough people with enough money flowing out of their ears to purchase some sort of stuff like that, you know, and it sets a benchmark for whatever the next, uh, the next piece of art in that sort of realm is going to be. And there you go. Um, can you please distinguish for me in the audience, the difference between a photo that is simply beautiful, elegant, and inspiring, just a great photo, but then distinguish that between a photo that will sell. Like, I think it goes back to what we've been saying. There's a certain portion of the market that'll buy something that's aesthetically pleasing, right? And aesthetics generally sell something that's beautiful or aesthetically pleasing and well articulated generally sells or gets a lot of applause from a mass market. Uh, is it enough to compel people to put it on their wall? Well, that's, that's a different story, right? So I don't know that 
the differentiation is simply aesthetics. Sometimes it's, I mean, there are a lot of beautiful things in the world, right? It, it, but just because you've photographed it well doesn't mean somebody wants to live with it. I think, I think you can't deny point of view. You can't deny certain things have a presence, certain images have a presence. So documenting beautiful things will get you a certain audience and a certain amount of applause uh, and a certain amount of sales if you wish. But consistently bringing your point of view to it and one that resonates, not just because, again, just because it's your point of view doesn't mean it's going to sell. But a point of view that resonates and uh, kind of is imbibed somehow, you know, whenever you take the personal and it speaks to the universal, people love it. And, you know, so if you have that sense to your work or if you just have a different perspective, uh, that's the work that will sell better in the long mm. run, right? Because it stands out just a little bit more. I talk about, you know, you can photograph a sunset. Well, sunset's a beautiful thing, but two people going to be standing in the same spot and take a picture of that sunset will look very different. One person's maybe in love with the light and the moment and the emotional quality, and one person's like, oh, my God, that's the prettiest thing. And hopefully those pictures will resonate differently. Mm. Uh, so it goes back to the photographer's participation in that moment and not just articulation and not just capture. There are a lot of people with great technical skill. We slow celebrate that, you know, and I, I love things of beauty, so I celebrate that, but uh, even more so somebody bringing their personal emotional quality to it. I'm writing a letter of reference for a former student, Piper, who I think is absolutely talented, and she photographs things that a lot of people find benign, but she just has a sensibility that she just gets it. I don't know mm. where or how or why, it doesn't matter. She just does. Mm. And that's an amazing thing, to be able to photograph everyday objects and she's just posting them right now. She's working on a, a larger project. Uh, it's, it's a little more social conscious. But the work's amazing. But it's very simple. So I can see a large portion of the population not valuing it. But if you understand kind of photography well and you understand what she's doing, you understand how her work resonates. So that work has the potential to sell at a higher price point, perhaps fewer images, even though they're, they're quite beautiful, but they're every day. So I don't know if that follows, but, but yeah, I mean, and and great work. Look, at Andres Gursky's work is aesthetically pleasing. Alex Soth, like a lot of the work that we that sells well and has great concept photographically, is also aesthetically pleasing, despite a lot of anti-aesthetic, anti-beauty rhetoric in the art world. Mm. Yeah, a lot of that work is gorgeous. I, uh, I, I apologize for the question. I actually just realized as you were answering it, the redundancy in the question, since everything we'd set up until that point was sort of answering that question. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what I was expecting there. Like, oh, you need to have the color orange. That's going to sell. You know, that's sort of what I was Yeah, saying. but it isn't. Right, it isn't. Mm. The, yeah, I mean, sir, there, there are people who will give you that answer. They'll say, you know, if you have more, you know, Reds sell better than blues, and mm. you know, and there are studies like that, right? But if you begin to make your work to have more reds than blues, because you're going to sell more, you're selling to, again, a mass audience probably at a lower price point, and you're just finding a different audience. Mm. So the answers to that, there are different forms of aesthetics. Look, I I think aesthetics are really important because they attract us to subjects we're not comfortable with. So if you look at Maplethorpe's imagery, not the, not some of the S&M work, but a lot of the work that made people very uncomfortable, right? People were attracted, I think, to the absolutely gorgeous articulation of his work, but then kind of put back by what they were attracted to. And that creates dissonance, right? I, I think really there's a lot of really gorgeous documentary work that attacks, tackles really difficult subjects in a really beautiful manner and it isn't to celebrate the tragedy but the beauty allows us to a way in and it allows people to engage things sometimes that they won't engage otherwise so beauty can be a tool I think more than being an object so when beauty is used as a, a tool in your photographs as something to deliver a message or to engage audience as opposed to just being a thing that you photographed it has greater power so mm -hmm. 
want to talk about aesthetics in that sense, I think aesthetics can and should be used kind of as a tool in your work as opposed to just a thing that mm-hmm. you photograph. Mm-hmm. Um, on approaching a gallery, just a few tips as a former gallery owner and someone who's consulting people on this work for an amateur, right? How many photos do I need to have ready to go? Um, could a mass email strategy have any sort of work? Is it just about having as wide a distribution as possible? Uh, do you print and then send them off? Can I send a digital portfolio? X, Y, and Z. Just unload big advice for an amateur who wants to be in galleries. <laughs> I think uh, the basic information is I don't think you do do it broadly because all galleries aren't the same. Hopefully we've made that point. I think you look for galleries or a series of galleries that represent similar but not the same work. Uh, Or marketplaces could be consignment shops, whatever you're aspiring to. And I would do a mix of mailers, regular post, and digital digital's free and you can but it's can be deleted and you get a lot of email so it's really hard to keep up mm-hmm. if you're looking at a mailer you can do a you know 20 30 50 mailers with a really beautiful image don't use really large type photographers are enamored with giant type and their name in huge bold and you know block letters uh, you don't need that the image should do the work mm-hmm. and uh, I would mail something, I would follow up with an email or email and follow up with a mail and do that every couple of months so people get to know who you are. You need a, you know, a series of touches, you call them, when people see your work or touch your work. Uh, in the email, you don't need to say, I'd like to have an exhibition. Everybody knows that's why you're writing. You can say, I'd like to introduce you to a new body of work or I'd like to introduce you to a new series. I think you need at least... 15 of a a body of work or a series before you start to send them out because as a gallerist I needed at least 20 Mm -hmm. and if you only had 20 that was problematic because I need to edit for my space so maybe we would show 17 but you need you need enough that the gallerist has a selection and then they can also curate for their space um send in an email a couple of digital files 72 dpi you don't want to send high res files because you don't want them to be printable five by seven something along that size big enough to be seen and and enjoyed but not super huge that takes long to download uh and then a link to your website your instagram so i can go see more work uh you know if you're interested please see this link please visit here it's really straightforward uh i would keep it simple People don't have a lot of time. They'll appreciate something that opens, reads easily, doesn't have a lot of words. You're not gonna talk somebody into giving you the exhibition if the work doesn't hold up. So I would do that. Same thing with the mailer. It's, you know, four by six is postcardy, a little bigger than that. You can put them in an envelope. If it's in an envelope that's opaque, you don't see it, it could get thrown out. If it's in a clear envelope, it's more expensive to send, but at least people see it. If it's not in an envelope and sent like a postcard, you're sure they'll see the work, but it might get dinged up in the mail. So, yeah, you need to you need a consistent body of work and a consistent theme, right? You you do because if you sent me a portfolio or you sent me four different kinds of work, hoping I'm going to choose the kind of work I like and I'm going to get back to you and say, oh no, I need more of this, it's not going to happen. I'm going to imagine that you don't understand who you are as an artist, mm-hmm. and I don't have the time to do that work. Uh, you need to do that work. You need. You could have two bodies of work. You could have three. You also don't want to have seven different kinds of work on your website. Here's my travel. Here's my documentary. Here's my portrait. Here. Because after a point, again, you're just, it's like throwing everything up and hoping somebody loves one. Yeah. And it doesn't look like you're really engaged in one thing or another or understand who you are. And as a gallerist, if I'm going to give you an exhibition, I need to know there's a next exhibition. So I can take a couple images and put them in a group show, that's great, which is what you normally do to test run somebody. You either put them in a group show or you bring their work into the gallery and show it to potential collectors. But I need to know there's another exhibition there somewhere. And if there isn't, then it's hard for me to make that investment. So 
understanding a theme, understanding your concept, understanding how that works, that all matters. Mm-hmm. More than I think most image makers understand. Yeah, and if you're showing me the, the best of the last 20 years of your work, that's great, but I need to know that. And then I need to know that that's really what I'm looking at. Yeah. If you're, if you're honest about who you accept into your gallery, how many of them was just, you love the photo and whatever they said was just thrown in the bin versus you were almost sold into it, even though the photo was maybe on the, on the edge. Oh no, the latter never, yeah, ever. Yeah. So it's um, always, if the photo is good enough presentation, all of that isn't necessarily, you know. Well, the photo has to be good enough and it has to be presented cleanly and neatly. If you show me photos that are dinged up or dirty, I don't care how much you promise, it's always the way they end up coming to the exhibition. Mm. So presentation matters. Um, If somebody's really difficult, it doesn't matter how good the work is. Life is hard enough. Uh, It's not worth it. I don't need to invite more crazy. There's enough crazy innately in in the art world and what we do. so, and the an artist statement matters because it matters to certain collectors and it matters to other people. So it should be well written and it should be like your bio should be clean and simple and well written. Um, neither should be rambling. But I think uh, an artist statement to me is secondary to the work. It supports the work. Now, for some people, the artist statement sets up the work, right? If it's a purely conceptual piece. Maybe, maybe the artist statement is what sets up the entire context. I still need the work to hold up on the wall, yeah. personally. And I think most, most curators do. Um, the artist statement just takes a varying role, a different role for different people. But I always do read the artist statement. You need to know where the artist is coming from. And sometimes I imagine one thing and then the artist is coming from someplace completely different and I'm pleasantly or horribly shocked. You know, it depends. Yeah. You know what? Don't I'm, try what to I'm, describe the work as doing more. Don't tell me you see the world in a way that other people don't. Don't tell me that you. I mean, you get people who come in and say that. I see. I see things pe- other people don't see. Hmm. Well, that's quite a statement, really. <laughs> and and when you see a lot of work, you probably don't, right? Yeah. But you may be, bring a different perspective to it, or you may bring a different concept to it, a different intellectual, or you you might see things a little more differently, but that's still quite the statement. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's about the work in the end. I mean, for most collectors, some collectors collect artists, some collect genres, some collect mediums, some collect galleries. You know, collectors have different reasons for coming back. It, it strikes me as like a, a capital intensive upfront pursuit. You know, if I'm here in Stockholm, and I had an ambition to say, be in a pa- London, I mean, God forbid, Manhattan or, or Paris, but say London or say Madrid, St. Petersburg, I don't know, uh, whatever the closest art markets are to me, maybe Oslo, that could be a good market. There's lots of rich people there. Um, it, it, it would require significant upfront investment to travel to the place, to send off to the place. Uh, to print without the guarantee that it's going to be sold. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm wondering if that could be almost a competitive advantage to someone who was willing to invest the upfront capital to get into a gallery or whether I'm just making too much of it and that's sort of nitty gritty. Well, sure, there's a competitive advantage to, you know, and some people can afford to do those things and some people do it even if they can't afford to because they want to make that happen. Um, I do think that you can, um, you don't need to make a whole series of large scale prints. If you don't want to, you don't need to print the whole exhibition up front. You need samples to show the gallery, but there are ways to mitigate that. Email is time consuming, but not expensive. Uh, Printing and mailing promos isn't that expensive. So there are ways to do it if you target your audience and target who you're sending it to. Um, hopefully you're making the work because you love to make it and, and aspiring to have it seen and collected. But it, it certainly becomes expensive if you get an exhibition because you do have to make those prints and you probably do have to frame them. So you want to manage your framing costs. You want to manage 
your other costs. Uh, you know, a big, heavy, expensive frame probably is going to limit the number of people who are going to buy that print because that's kind of not going to be their favorite frame. It's yours. And it's also going to make shipping more expensive. And so I think, again, let your image do the work. Keep the framing simple. I like a nice white frame uh, because unless you're printing black and white, black frames compete with the image. If you walk into a gallery and you have 20 color images and 20 black frames, the first thing you see is 20 black squares or 20 black rectangles. It's the most amazing graphic. You can't fight it. But if you have, say, white frames or off-white frames, you get a nice drop shadow from the light. First thing you see when you walk in that gallery are 20 color photographs. So I would, I would manage that cost down if I were having a first show. You know, my first show, I went all out and spent a lot of money. <laughs> It took a long time to recuperate, years and years and years, despite, despite it being shown, shown twice. twice. Yeah. yeah. So, so you can manage well, that. Well, look, Thomas, I am looking at my list of questions, and I do still have a number of things I'd love to talk to you about, but I get the sense that it's a good place to wrap it up, and should uh, you be interested, we could maybe do this again in six months or a year and speak about the other side of things, because... I would also, just as a, just as a curiosity, I'd love to know more about this whole notion of um, investable art. People who will buy art just for the sake of putting it in a free port as a way to mm -hmm. launder money, as a way to also just have side investments for themselves. Talk talk to you about Unsplash. What you think about Unsplash? Um, you know, and other sort of ins and outs of the photography world but like we've got a two and a half run, run time two and yeah. a half hour runtime so far so i don't know what do you think about that let's do that brilliant let's then in that. that case i'll just leave you with the two questions that i have asked every guest and okay. so if you wouldn't mind um can you talk about a moment in your life when you experienced it and as you look back on it you just can't believe you were a part of it it was so remarkable. Um, a moment that I can't believe I was a part of. Well, I mean, there are many. I think since we're talking about being an artist, as an exhibiting artist, my first exhibition in New York, I never imagined I'd get an exhibition and never imagined I'd have an exhibition in New York. And I left that exhibition elated. Um, I didn't think life got any better at that moment, you know. Uh, the work that I exhibited, I'd been told in art school to put in a drawer and show my friends and maybe not show anyone else. And, uh, and so that felt pretty good. Um, and then I had an exhibition a little later that was reviewed in The New Yorker. I was pick of the week for four weeks. And to me, that was kind of the peak of my art career. I, I love to make artwork and I love to show it and I'm, I'm deeply honored and thrilled when anybody wants to buy it and put it in their home. But I never imagined either of those things would happen in my career and you know, it's probably as good as it's going to get for me at this point uh, for, because you have to dedicate yourself to being an artist 100% and I, I do it as an, a very guilty indulgence. Yeah. So I'll go with that. Beautiful. Um, and then finally, if you could witness a conversation between any two people, dead or alive, no language barrier, say, listen to a podcast, who would they be? Oh, my parents. They both passed. And uh, I'd give anything to listen to a conversation with them at this point. And if you're looking for kind of great people, uh, you know, they're my two favorites. So I, I would, I would, I'm going to go with them. I'll leave it at that. Perfect. I'm so happy you did that. After I've recorded 75-ish, no one's ever given a personal answer, which is surprising because that would be my personal answer as well. So that's amazing. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for allowing me to, <laughs> I suppose, get a free access into your giant history and experience within the photography world. So thank you very much for that. Sure. sure. Pleasure. pleasure. Well, that was magnificent. Thank you again to Thomas for parting with some of his time, your time, if you're listening. It was a pleasure to speak with you. And yeah, I really, I learned a lot. So 
uh, I sort of think I said this in the introduction, but the story of serendipity from the train platform to Russia is a very inspiring one because it's not one of any particular grandiose, but it mostly reminds me of the infinite potentiality of life. And before you roll your eyes, it's just as another story that proves that you never know what tomorrow is going to bring you, especially if you are putting yourself out there. Invite serendipity into your life. How can you predict a future of infinite possibilities based off a finite experience of the past? Finally, similar episodes to this that you might be interested in uh, is uh, Beyond Persian, the Swedish wildlife photographer, episode 62. Uh, and then, of course, the master himself, Marcel van Oosten, Dutch photographer and one of the most celebrated wildlife photographers in the world. That was episode 64. And I can also say with excitement that two of the world's most celebrated conflict and wartime photographers are going to be coming on the podcast as well. And just to give you a hint, they're both female, if, and if that narrows it down. Perhaps people might be able to know who they are. Finally, if you're still with me, my very generous and dear listener, my ambition for this podcast is to corner the podcasting market for eclectic curiosities in whatever country it is, whatever demographic you are, whoever you are, whatever market you exist in, to corner that market for eclectic curiosities in podcasting. And so it's an extremely broad niche. Therefore, that's, I guess, a uh, paradox. It's not a niche at all then. It's very broad. And um, it's very hard for the algorithms to exactly know where to index it or what to do with it. So the only thing you can do is to provide feedback into the algorithm. And that's just a fancy way of saying review. Leave a review, swipe up your Spotify, give me five stars, go to your Apple, give me five stars, write something nice. If you're on Good Pods, write the episode. If you're on anything, if you're on YouTube, I don't know where you're listening to this, but if you could leave reviews, the podcast algorithms are in the stone age. They're shocking. They do a terrible job at actually personalizing what your search result may be. So the only way to get this in front of more people's eyes is to get more feedback into the various algorithms. So I would encourage you to please, next time you're in an art gallery, next time you speak into Thomas, next time you come across someone on the street, just take their phone out of their hand, swipe into their Spotify, listen to an episode, and then of course, uh, you know, leave the five star review. Next time you're in a long traffic jam, just get out of the car, knock on a few windows, ask them to leave a nice generous review to the Curious Wellbeing podcast. And this goes without saying, your family, your friends, everyone you've ever met should also uh, be reviewing. So that's all I am uh, yeah, again, very grateful to have spoken to Thomas and uh, grateful for his time, grateful for you listening, especially now if you are, I suppose this is two and a half hours in or something. So you're all a bunch of legends. Take it easy. Ciao.